So this is a test. This is a test.
And we like to get started and thank everyone for being here. So let's turn over to Dr. Neal to start our, our work session. Yeah, I'm so excited. We have our new central office open and working so efficiently. I think our level of competency has increased. And I'm going to start with recognitions to those of us in the room who helped us move. It was about moving furniture. It was about moving technology. There was a moment during Memorial Day weekend when I was totally um, frozen as our technology was unplugged and we didn't have internet access. And that was just about a 24 hour period. But I, I do want to say that our technology department and our maintenance department worked 24 seven for weeks and weeks and weeks, and especially the technology department working overnight one night during Memorial Day weekend to get everything unplugged and replugged again. You know. So that, that particular story has gone out across Trustful. And there is a local business leader who heard about our story and about your work above and beyond the call of duty. And he wanted to give back to those who serve. And he wanted to remain anonymous. So we have $100 gift cards donated to our employees in technology and maintenance departments for all of your hard work. And when I call your name, I would love for you to come up and get your $100 gift card and do the walk of fame and fist yeah. bump or shake hands with the Board of Education. You all did it. Department, Ryan Ferris. Thank you so much. Paul oh, Sharp. <laughs> Scott Boston. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> and y'all stay at the top. Yes, thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Well Chamberlain, she's at a conference. Uh, Dwayne Jackson, Matt Kinsley. Thank you. 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 Stephen Swinford, thank you. Christine Roberts, thank you for everything. One, two, three. So we love this. You want to tell us a little story about what that night was like? You all did work all during the night. And April texted me. She's at a conference, and I appreciate you all so much. But I got a text at six a.m. Yes, ma'am. April said, "Oh, I forgot. I hadn't texted you in a while." Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so tell us the story about the all nighter. So, what time did we start? Probably, <laughs> I, I think four p.m. Yeah, sir. Four. We 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 came in that day around one. Um, we actually pulled the plug on everything around four, and uh, we worked throughout the night. Um, April got us all dinner, and uh, we just everything was back up and running about five thirty. It was a long night, but it was all up. We had a plan to start. And then by the time we got everything over here, we just blew away the plan. We're like, let's just do it differently than we had drawn it up. <laughs> so that uh, that cost us an extra eight hours. But. <laughs> but you can walk in that room and it is the most beautiful room you have seen. It looks so <laughs> <good>. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah. 
We'll have to visit the server right now. There's not a cable out of place. Everything is beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Good. And we're all under one roof now. Yes, ma'am. So technology is, is here with all of us. Maintenance is here with all of us. And we're so excited about that. So um, I did I did have to get used to it because I called Dwayne with a technology issue one morning. And I thought, well, it'll take him a while to get here. And he was at my door in five seconds. <laughs> You're upstairs, that's right, because I'm used to him having to drive across town. So we're thrilled to have you on. Thank you, Ryan. You want to tell us a little story from your department about the furniture and the pros and cons of getting copiers through doorways and all of the things that, that we had to deal with on that. Yeah, these guys here, I couldn't do it without them. They're uh, a lot of knowledge, just the four guys right here. Paula keeps us straight in the office, keeps everything like that. <laughs> These guys right here take care of about almost a million square feet of buildings every day, maintenance wise. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot. <laughs> and they deserve recognition. Yeah, they do. Whatever you decide to do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. It could not have been any better. The move across town <clears throat> with the technology, with the furniture, with everything. It just didn't have been better. Moving is pretty easy on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. not do that. Still wait, guys. Right. I still wait. Um, they didn't move the cats. I, I saw those cats yesterday <laughs> in the parking lot. I thought, like, yeah. I thought they're the Sanders cats. That's awesome. Well, I want to move into our agenda and talk about school safety first. And Chief Rush is here with his crew, and I'll introduce him in just a minute, but I wanted to share some information from the SSA conference on school safety. And as you get you all can go ahead. As you know, um, school safety is now at, at the forefront um, in terms of, of these elements of school safety dealing with facilities uh, and intruders based on, on the raw elementary event that's the most recent school shooting. Now, school safety has been at the forefront of our lives forever. In the last two years, it was health. It wasn't about gun violence and intruders. It was more about the health. So we've shifted back to our, our need and our appreciation for SROs and the police department. It's also about mental health. And now it's also about cybersecurity. So Dwayne is here to uh, talk about cybersecurity. Chief Rush is here to talk about facilities and our physical safety. And then the unseen is mental health, that component. So we'll talk about that a lot as well. So these are, are the main components. Um, and Mr. Kirkland is here, and he's in, in charge of our overall facilities. And, and I do believe our facilities are in great shape. Uh, we have, uh, we're, I think we are a school system with the most SROs in terms of our ratio. We may be the, the only school system with five schools and seven SROs. Most school systems have a one-to-one -one ratio, or not even that. And we have seven with five schools. Um, so our, um, our personnel are in place. Everyone is trained every year. Generally, we have our procedures uh, and our action plans in place. And one of the most important things we can have is situational awareness. And um, just to be aware of everything going on around us at all times. So I just, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide, but I do want to show you a couple of documents. They talk to us a lot about mental health and the adult community outside of our school, the external forces that come into our schools unbeknownst to anyone. And to always be aware of that perimeter, be aware of uh, angry people, angry parents, they talk to us a lot about uh, PTSD awareness and the trauma that people experience during COVID. And they're coming out of COVID as some having some experience with trauma and their, their, their mental health needs attention. Um, the other piece of what they gave us is about general school security. And I worked with Chief Rush <clears throat> all through the years. It's, it's very complex, the, the approaches are complex. We don't show our whole playbook, but it's about the school physical safety as well. Uh, they had a whole session on cyber security, and that is the unseen. It's just like mental health. It's coming into a place where you can't see it. Dwayne will talk to us about the cyber security. Then, of course, in our uh, procedures and action plans, 
we have our crisis finder that covers everything. It covers intruders, school shooters, um, everything from chemical spills to um, anything going on inside the building. So we are vigilant, we are aware. And one of the most important things I mentioned is the connectivity between the students and adults. That if you see something, say something. We'll be going over this at Institute um, with, with the teachers as well. We'll be giving emphasis for our Institute. So basically, uh, everything is okay until it's not. So we have to be ready for that moment, and we are. So just a few artifacts from our Trustful City Schools. First is our PACE program. And you have a handout of what our, our PACE program for character looks like. And the um, three things in red are the things we have. Our PACE program for character skill building uh, morphs into an anti-bullying framework and that morphs into suicide prevention. And so we have those things in place. Now, that's for all students. It is through our school counseling program. The other three things are with, with parent permission and according to parent need. So we have mental health counseling and we have agencies that can help with mental health counseling. We have a new family resource center on that side of the hallway. And any student that goes through our counseling program here in red, and if the counselor notices that there might be a mental health issue, the parents are called. And the new legislation requires parent permission for mental health counseling. School counseling does not need parent permission. Mental health counseling does. And that's the new legislation. So uh, none of this will happen without parent involvement. And that's, that is brand new for this year. Um, and these, this sets our behavioral expectation. And it works well because in number one, we're trying to tell students how to act. We try to tell students how to treat each other. And when there is some sort of harassment or bullying, real or perceived, we go right back to what did we say about how we treat each other and what did we say the behavioral expectations were. So all of these work very well together and, and we will keep these off at the end of this particular school. So um, internally, we can control um, the PACE program, and on the next slide, it shows the general PACE program where we want people to be happy and thankful and forgiving and confident and connected. And then if, if they're down here under the water, we have lifesaver um, life personnel in place to help them. And we don't want them to feel lonely or disappointed or isolated. Yes? Yeah, that last slide, at what point, like the intervention, you know, and make a connection at school, but at what point does it go over to parents? Are they alerted if a child is fully? I mean, if that starts that framework or that connection, at what point are the parents brought in? Are they brought in immediately just for awareness? It, it is on a case by case basis. And usually, in a case of bullying or perceived bullying, the parents bring it to us. Okay, not the child. Or something. And, and, and but they can, but it's, it's really okay. Every case is so different. It really, really is. But, but we're glad to bring the parents in because they are our partners and our helpers. So, uh, this particular piece is from the state, and Chief Rush and I were working this together uh, to understand the terminology. And the terminology is not changing this year that I know of. Uh, but every day, trustful six schools, we are on the yellow. We are in heightened awareness. And just to give you the cultural impact of that, uh, this means a potential may exist for an unusual situation, and all parties should have heightened awareness to react as needed. That's where we are every day in trustful six schools. And the last bullet says check exterior doors to make sure they are secure. So our exterior doors are locked at all times. And that's how we start the day every day. We don't ever let our guard down. And we start here. If there need to be any changes for securing an area or if something's going on in the perimeter, the police, the SRO are always involved. So that is, that is our culture in understanding an unusual situation may exist at any time. 
and that is for internal and external forces. So the next slide just gives um, examples of mental health conditions and when parents have to be brought in if they're not already, uh, based on Ms. Brown's question. Uh, this, this is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and Health Disorders. And if a guidance counselor notices that one of these particular symptoms are emerging in a child, then the parent will be contacted and the mental health counselor or the agency to help that family will be brought in. And parent permission is required for this. So, um, then the last slide I want to share before I turn it over to Chief Rush to have questions is something that I will share with, with teachers at Institute. And this really will set our culture for our emergence out of COVID into the new normal, whatever that looks like, is to ask them to please, and, and we will train them and the counselors and the administration to um, identify students who appear troubled, angry, isolated, make extra effort to connect positively, complete and follow up with five deep roster activities. It's such a great tool for our school system. Where we have teachers identify students they can they can connect with and we ask them to connect with them use the character and uh, traits and skills to facilitate positive attitudes know that the students gravitate toward guns weapons drugs what social media sites they use uh, listen and look for violent or vulgar language musical lyrics drawings and bad social media posts uh, always ask for help and if you see something, say something. And again, double check those doors to be sure they were locked. So, before I turn it over to Chief Rush, the next slide was a highlight from CASRO. CASRO is the Alabama Association for School Resource Officers. And many of our SROs were there. Show of hands who was, who was there in the room. But lots of you guys were there. I know Ms. Abney was there in all those days. But this slide was sent to me from the conference. And Trustful City Schools was highlighted as a model school district on school safety, and that was unbeknownst to us. Did you guys know that was going to happen? I didn't either. I thought, wow, we just got held up by TASRO. And so this, this circulated, and I'm so proud of our police department. Uh, we have had our awards of excellence, our SROs, one of the largest units within the Trustful Police Department. It's just fantastic. So that's a great segue to turn it over to Chief Rush to introduce his guests who are here today. And um, the next slide will give him some form of introduction. I don't know if they're all here or not, but the SROs are listed on the next slide. So Chief Rush, we are going up to the top, and I'll sit over here on the sidelines while you talk to us about SROs and school safety. Did you have anything about I'm just going to say a few things. And now I'm going to turn it over to Captain Caldwell. He's going to go a little more in detail. Um, first thing I want to do is ask a question. What is the first line of defense at a school to any active killer situation? First line of defense. It's no, it's no secret that the shooter and the killer in Texas came in through an unlocked door, unsecured door. So that's your first line of defense. And we do a really good job and very vigilant about checking the doors, but sometimes things happen. Um, if he couldn't have got in that school, you know, that's happening about the SRO. He's not in there, he can call any damage. So uh, I just want to stress that we all need to work together and communicate and take suggestions and swap information to be visual. Come on up, <clears throat> This is Captain Caldwell. He's, uh, he's my uh, administrative captain over uh, SROs and several other units. So he's just going to go over a few things with y'all. I'm going to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Um, I just want to begin by saying that I feel like I got the greatest job in the world. I work for the best police department in the world. I'm associated with the best school system. 
in the state, world, whatever. So y'all do outstanding. We appreciate y'all. Thank you. I know most of you. There might be a few that you've not been introduced. Uh, so I'll go through that first. My name is Captain Greg Cardwell. I command the Special Operations and CID Support Services Divisions of the Trustful Police Department. Uh, in my position, I answer the Chief Rush uh, and I assist him in the daily operations of the department. I've got 23 years experience in law enforcement and I've been supervising SROs for the past seven years. I'd like to thank Dr. Mill and y'all, Trustful City School Board, for having us here, and it's an honor to be speaking with you right now. Briefly, I'll be speaking about school safety or SROs, Trustful Police Department's dedication to having safe schools. As you know, we're blessed here in Trustful, as was mentioned earlier, to have seven total qualified SROs within the school. Um, I'll introduce those that are here Right now, we've got a couple on patrol that's on calls. We've got two that are out with health issues. Uh, Lieutenant Beth Dillon commands this SRO unit. If you'll stand up, Lieutenant. So <laughs> Officers Bates and Goolsby, they're at the high school. They're not present right now. Uh, they're on active calls. Um, Officer Antonio. Cahaba Elementary. <laughs> officer Bowen, he's one of the officers that is still out on sick leave. He had a procedure done uh, a couple weeks ago, but he's doing fine and is expected to be back on the school year. Officer Smith, he was one of our past SROs. He's not present at the time. Uh, he's also out with a uh, sick family at the time, at this time. He has been a SRO in the past and decided to come back uh, into the program. So we're glad to have him back. He did a good job for us. And Officer Brown, he's at Magnolia Elementary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, honestly, can't say enough about these guys. I mean, they uh, they do great work, uh, help us out because we're not there. Uh, they have not let us down. They do a great job in the schools, and we appreciate it. But our SRO program began in 2003 with only two officers, one at the high school and one at the middle school. So we've come a long way. Both leaps and bounds since then. Our SROs are all well trained and are all veterans within law enforcement. Uh, going over 20 or past 20 years experience in law enforcement. Recently, as Dr. Neil mentioned, our SROs attended the conference in Orange Beach. Uh, this is their yearly uh, Safe Schools Conference. There's uh, SROs from all over the state and southeastern states of the United States. It's a big uh, conference, for sure. <clears throat> and at the conference, they're instructed on new ways to increase school safety and network with others on ways to improve safety within the schools. I was very proud to learn upon the return from the conference, as Dr. Neil mentioned earlier, that the Trustful City Schools and Trustful Police Department were presented to the audience as an example of how every school and police department should operate to keep the students and staff safe. We're blessed here in Trustful, as I said, because we have so many SROs within the system, um, which is, without a doubt, we, I feel confident in saying we have the most per school in the state as far as SROs. Uh, <clears throat> all this wouldn't be possible without Mayor Cho, City Council support of the program, for that, I'd like to thank them and I'm very grateful uh, for them allowing us to be in the schools with as much, uh, many officers as we do have. The speaker at the conference, while they were there, uh, he referred to us, and I quote, uh, the New England Patriots of School Safety. 
<laughs> so uh, that's a good thing. Uh, this recognition is received because of the hard work we all do as officers, school administrators, and staff working together to accomplish these goals. <clears throat> but while we're very proud of our accomplishments, we can never take the attitude that an incident will never occur here. We must always remain vigilant in our efforts to ensure that our schools remain safe. This involves everyone at school, working together, making sure everything is addressed in a timely manner. One thing we can do, as Dr. Neil touched on, Chief Rush did also, is uh, we, we've got to be vigilant on our exterior doors. There needs to be one entrance and exit to the school. Uh, I have spoken to Lieutenant Dillon, who's address this matter with the SROs. The elementary schools, they do very well. No complaints. Uh, the middle school does a good job. High school being as large as it is, as many students as there are, them being older, we get a lot of prop doors uh, at the high school. The SROs do the best they can to address this situation. But as you know, they can't be at every door on at the school at one time. Nobody can. Staff can't, teachers can. Everybody's got a job to do. But if we all work together, including students, you know, uh, take the self-initiative that if they see an open door, because of what recently happened in Uvalde, to let somebody know, let SRO know, or close it themselves. We take care of this first line of defense. It's going to make a world of difference. Somebody's not going to get inside the school without our knowledge and without us knowing where to address the person inside the school. If they're at the front trying to get in, then that's help out a lot. And that's from them, Sergeant Filetti. Uh, He's hands on with SROs every day. Um, he mentioned that to us that the SROs at the high school, they do struggle at times making sure it's secure. <clears throat> like I said, I'm sure everybody's aware of uh, the recent events in Uvalde, Texas. And I'll be honest with you, with you uh, this uh, has worried me more than any event that occurred in the past. Uh, like I said, I've been a police officer for 23 years, uh, and this situation didn't have to happen, shouldn't have happened, in my opinion. I can make everybody this promise, if a similar situation ever occurred at any of our schools, the reaction will be very different very different. Our officers will not hesitate, wait for backup, or wait for a command to advance the threat. The threat will be engaged by us from first contact, and the suspect will be stopped. What, saying that, say farther, uh, we're the ones of us, the police officers that are not at the schools, we're going to keep calling until that school's deemed safe. We don't, the SROs are first line. Uh, everybody's coming. Patrol's coming. Administration's coming. We're all going to keep coming till the threat is stopped. <clears throat> Not only do our SROs train for all possible events, but all officers here at the Trust Police Department train continuously with a dedication to learn and increase their skills as officers. This is in large part due to Chief Rush's dedication to training and wanting to have the best trained police force possible. Sergeant Higgs, he's on for our training unit. He makes sure that all of us as officers are meeting their training goals. As you know, we recently got a new building on Deerfoot. It's an extremely nice building that uh, houses our patrol division. Also, there's two indoor ranges there. 
Now our training has increased probably tenfold because we can use that facility anytime, day or night, no matter the weather. It's always 70 degrees in there and it makes things a lot better than going to an outdoor range. And a lot of times at outdoor range, it could be stormy. We would be there because everything's scheduled out. So if it's raining that day, you just get wet. So we're blessed to have that. Uh, we're thankful to have that resource. <clears throat> we bear this responsibility with pride as law enforcement officers within the city of Trust. When we take our oath as police officers, we understand that there's a great responsibility that comes with wearing a badge. We all understand that there's a possibility that we may be asked to sacrifice ourselves for another person. I can personally speak for each officer here at Trustful Police Department. We do not take this responsibility lightly, nor do our families. We all accept that one day we could be standing between innocence and evil. The children in our schools or on the street or anywhere else. We're all prepared to do that, make the ultimate sacrifice for that child or person. We accept that. I say these things to hopefully give you some comfort in these trying days that we live in. I want you to know that the trust for the police department is steadfastly dedicated to your safety every day and will always strive to be the best that we can be. Thank you for your, your trust, and it's an honor to work with the Trustful School System. Thank you. share a story quickly on how great how great they are and uh, I, th I don't even know that officer Antonio knows this is about him so I ride my bike every day through Trussell do you know this uh, I don't think so okay. <laughs> one day I was riding during school hours and I wasn't even processing what I was doing I usually ride through the circle and then I ride through the parking lot I used to do this about four o'clock well this happened to be about two o'clock and I ride through the circle and I ride through the parking lot. You must have spotted me because you met me in the parking lot and you said, ma'am, school is going on. We cannot be riding through the parking lot. I, I, I was so glad I had my helmet on and I touched my head. <laughs> Year, lines were a little long, but I watched some SRO officers in the line and just there had to be 20 to 30 elementary school kids who were high fiving them, shaking their hand. And I thought to myself, you're so much more than just a police officer protecting us. You're an ambassador. And I thought, not only for what it meant for those little kids, but what did it mean for all those parents watching that? So just thank you for what you do all the way around. That's absolutely amazing. That speech was fantastic. So, yeah, thank you all again. If you ever have the unfortunate luck of a tree falling on your car, <laughs> call Officer Antonio. <laughs> and he'll come and help you immediately. So now I appreciate that day as well. And uh, you were you were there for the singing background too. So now I, we do appreciate you all, and we know that we are in great hands with our men and women. We love you so much, and we appreciate you, and we, we need you. We need you more than you ever know. It's such a comfort to our faculty, our staff, and our community to know that you're there. And I appreciate your dedication through those words of uh, Captain Carter, but also I appreciate what you, all the things that you have to say. And it, it becomes more and more important. You know, we started small and we're growing larger. And you're recalling 
uh, we're answering the call to our growth. So thank you all so much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, I'll uh, get a, a photo of all the police officers uh, that are here. And if you all come on up front, the board will stand behind you guys. And um, we'll put you in the work next time. So, <laughs> thank y'all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have one more piece of school safety, and that would be Dwayne Jackson presenting on cybersecurity and our measures to keep all that data safe. All right. So um, I'll give you the microphone. Come on up. Okay. That's the last time you work today. Then I'll take questions on everything related to school safety before we move on to the next time. So I think we'll ask if I would just kind of go over a few of the things that we've been doing on um, cybersecurity to keep trustful safe. Um, a couple of years ago, we purchased a new firewall. Um, and for those of y'all that aren't aware, a firewall basically, if you have an internet here and you have trustful here, firewall's in the middle and it keeps out all the bad guys. So we put that into place. Um, and with that, allowed us the opportunity to put VPN software on their devices, which allows the VPN software essentially is a tunnel from the teacher's laptop back into trustful. So if they're at Starbucks, if they're at home or wherever, they're coming back through our firewall to protect them. Um, the other things that we have been doing is we are members of ALEP, which is uh, Alabama's Leaders in Educational Technology. And they have um, worked with legislators like our own Danny Garrett um, to get cybersecurity grants um, coming to us once a year. Last year, they presented us for $25,000. This coming year, we get $68,000. Um, with the $25,000 last year, we purchased um, an addition to our antivirus software um, that helps keep us a little more safe. Um, we purchased two-factor authentication, um, and we'll be rolling out some to high stakeholders. Um, and we, April was keen on us using that for training going forward. So uh, Matt and myself have been to a local Birmingham Cyber uh, conference where we've learned some things. ALEP hosts conferences year round. Three times this past year, we have went and it's been based strictly on cybersecurity. Um, and they have presented on ideas that we can use. Um, they've awakened or shown us uh, the Department of Homeland Security offers free things to us being our local schools and district. Um, and we're going to start using some of those, some vulnerability scans, um, some local machine scans, um, and they'll kind of help us review our disaster recovery policies. Um, and all that's free. And probably the biggest thing is um, Nova 4, which is our phishing software. I'm not sure if y'all's companies fish y'all, send y'all fake emails to see if you'll click on them. Um, the local or the education in the United States, um, there's about an 18% click rate. Somebody will click on an email sent to them. The first time we sent one out, we were about a 10% click rate. And we every other month, we send a fake email out once a month and then a training email once a month. Um, and we're down between three and four percent now. So we're really seeing some dividends on that. Um, and I think that's everything. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay. You sure believe that if you don't have a safe school, you don't have anything. You gotta have a safe school first. So that concludes the school safety piece. Are there any questions for me or the police officers or Dwayne? On cybersecurity or physical safety or anything going into the school year that you'd like to ask about. All right, thank you very much. Um, I will let you all slip out if you want to because we're going to move on to programs for students. But thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have three new classes for students in high school. I'm super excited about offering them three new classes. The first one is sports medicine. And Lance Walker is here to introduce you to them and he'll tell you the story about how this evolved. So Lance, come on up. And I appreciate you being here. And you all take the way. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Yeah, what our athletic trainers are provided to us through ATI. So uh, we are very fortunate to have Mitch Bibb uh, join us in January. Uh, he did an outstanding job with all of our spring sports. So he's 
getting ready for his first full school year with us. But uh, he taught a class at his previous high school and uh, brought it to our attention. And um, as we talked to the administrative administration of the high school, we had a lot of interest from students. Uh, so we're really excited about adding this. So uh, Mitch, if you want to come up and share with us for a minute. I uh, prepared a small outline of how our course will look. This will probably progress a little bit between now and the start of August. I know we are in the process of looking at getting a particular textbook and workbook, and so that might change how we put the syllabus together a little bit for the for the course. Um, so like Lance said, my name's Mitch. Uh, I've been an athletic trainer for about 30 years, and I've worked uh, through professional sports and college sports and then also high school sports and among some other areas as well. Uh, when I came back to Alabama and I was at Health City High School, um, it was brought to my attention that they would like to have a sports medicine course that was taught. So uh, they hired me as a contract, as a contract teacher to come and do that. I learned something very quickly that um, students are very interested in this field. And this field is one of the fastest growing medical fields in the country even overtaking nursing. Um, and there, there's so many different avenues to go down. The sports medicine is a very broad term. Uh, athletic training is just really kind of the, uh, the, front, the front line person, right, of the sports medicine team. So how we're gonna try to put this course together is we wanna make this fun for the students. We don't want it to be some boring lecture every day that you have to sit through and take notes. So how, uh, how I plan on doing this is, uh, is we will start with a project at the beginning of the school year. Uh, we'll teach them the careers that are out there, what a sports medicine team is made up, or who a sports medicine team is made up of. And then we will design an athletic training program and facility, and then add all of the layers onto that, such as the legal issues that come with a sports medicine program and an athletic training program, um, the insurance requirements, that are needed. Uh, we will look at how to do record keeping. We will look at the supply and budgetary needs to put a program together. They will not only design a facility, but they will also supply that facility. And then we will look at all, and these are all listed out um, for you in this little outline, but we will take them through that process. And when we're done, you've got this virtual facility that you've got in your head as a student and then you start acting in that facility. Okay, now we've got a, well, now we have an athlete, we have somebody playing a sport coming into that athletic training room. How do we take care of them? And athletic training is broken down into five domains. Uh, administration, which will be mostly what you look at when you're designing the facility, right? Teaching, record keeping and budget and supply. And then we go into injury prevention, immediate care of injury, evaluation of injury, and then, of course, treatment and rehabilitation of injury. So after we put this facility together and they've got this idea in their head, we'll start acting on that and teaching them what we do to prevent injuries. We'll make this very hands-on. We'll have a lot of little projects within the big project. The, the initial project will take about half of the school year, and then the second half of the year, we'll dive into each of these domains and teaching them some basic evaluation skills. To kind of end and tell you where we would like to take this is in a couple of different directions. We also offer our students a voluntary opportunity to serve with our athletic trainers, our certified athletic trainers. There will be three of us at the high school and the middle school that they can serve with us during the course of the afternoon after school hours and learn kind of the hands-on stuff, right? That's separate from the course, at least initially. And then we would also like to entertain in the years to come the state of Alabama offers three courses. This beginner's course, which we're going to be teaching. They offer an uh, intermediate course and an advanced course. So in the intermediate course, and there's a lot of different directions to go based on the outline the state offers to you. But in the intermediate course, you take the students through the rehabilitation process. And then in the advanced course, you take them through an evaluation of injury process, right? So the initial course kind of covers everything and gives you a broad overview. So a student would take, I think it's uh, beginners of biomedical science principles of, principles of biomechanical science they take that as the freshman year the beginners classes are sophomore and then if the school system and you guys are so gracious we'll add the other courses by the time they're a senior they've had four courses 
towards this kind of desire maybe to look into a sports letter support. Well, there be any, if, they, if we were to you know go that route, is there any kind of certification at the at the end of a course, or they just they just have these courses? That's an excellent question. There's a couple of directions that we can take with them. Um, so just to be very quick, I know my time is limited. Uh, a one minute story. My daughter is a sophomore at JSU. Uh, as a freshman, she entered their student athletic training pro their student athletic training program. She now is, a, is starting her sophomore year is on is on a half, half scholarship. It's an athletic scholarship. It's an athletic training scholarship at 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 JSU. By the time she's a senior, she will be on a full scholarship. To answer your question is, first of all, no, there's not a certification as an athletic trainer that happens after a graduate degree. However, it does allow that student to walk into a number of universities, such as JSU, Troy, University of Alabama, um, and be involved in an undergraduate program that leads to the graduate program that eventually leads to your certification as an athletic trainer. Sounds good. Some of the other things that we can do is, and we will not do this this year, but some of the things we can do is certify each student in CPR. We can certify each student upon graduation of high school. And we can certify them as strength conditioning coaches, as personal trainers, which are excellent kind of summertime and, and college jobs. So there are some certifications that we can look at. Yes. So there will be any as a senior in high school, would there be a chance for them to get get more at the college and get work together in that aspect? No, because the universities, just like we do in high school, when we put a student with us, and I'm not talking about the classroom setting, but this kind of after after school program, they are they are working under our medical license. So whatever we allow them to do, right. we have to make sure that we don't lose our medical license, right? Uh, athletic trainers are allied healthcare professionals that have a medical license in the state of Alabama. We are certified nationally, but we are licensed by each individual state. And Alabama has a very strong program. Um, but to answer your question a little bit further, to put a student into a college setting before they get to the college setting is not possible because of that concern of you're working under somebody's medical license. However, my goal, and I saw this with my own daughter and I've seen this with other students as well. My goal is to interact with those students so that we put them in front of those university athletic trainers that gets them into the program as a freshman. It, it's, there, there's, there's such incredible opportunities for scholarship money that's out there. We just have to know where to look for it. Does this become what, an academy for us, or is this a class of the LSA Curiosity? So it's a state approved course. We now have it at Hewitt Trustful High School. Full credit course is open to sophomores through seniors, prerequisite principals, and final med. So, right. so I mean, I, mean, I think of academy like engineering or electrical. It's like, medical. This to me sets you up. I'm just curious, is this part of the academy thing? It's, or is it it's, part, it's part of the biomedical oh, academy. Oh, okay. Cool. So you get a distinction because graduation with you. Question. I mean, so my daughter's surviving sophomores. Well, this one, you know, obviously, she this is a new thing for her. Like if you have somebody that's an upperclassman and they haven't taken the intro to biomedical, can they, can they go back and take it as a junior and even get, get a couple of these classes? Or whatever? Yes, as long as they're in the progression, I can do that. I think we've had to change the rules a little bit for the first year, right? Right, because it's, it's possible that, that we can insert uh, principles of biomed at the middle school and the freshmen can take this and move on forward. But right now, it's the sophomores through seniors. Okay. One of my goals here is, and like Lance said, I'm employed by ATI, right? And I'm contracted to, I come to work at the high school and the middle school every day, right? I don't go to a clinic or anything like that. But to me, my loyalty is to Hugh Trustful High School. And I don't want to say that if ATI is sitting in the room, but because I am loyal to who I work for. But this is where I come to work. And so me being here and taking care of the medical needs of our student athletes, that's not where it has to end. It should be that we're partners with the school system and that we are partners with these students and not just the athletes. We want to create opportunity for these students to become part of a group 
And a lot of these students that enter our program, they're, we have two that are special needs. So we take those students on, right? That gives them some identity. And then we have students that don't have a group. They're not tied into sports. They're not tied into theater or band. They just don't have that group. And we're putting them in that. And I, I take that very seriously as being a partner in the school system. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thumbs up. Well done. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. We're very excited. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around it, but for a future teacher, if you could liken it to future teachers, the teacher might go into early childhood, might go into secondary, might go into special ed. Now our biomedical academy can yield nurses, paramedics, sports medicine, athletic trainers. We're starting to expand that academy. I'm, I'm very excited about it. I know a lot of students will be interested. In. It's awesome. Yes, it's Thank awesome. you, Lance. Thank you, Mr. The next two courses new to trust here at Trustful High School are in fine arts. So we can shift gears to fine arts now. Uh, the first one is technical theater. And technical theater is a full credit course. The teacher of record will be Valerie Lemons, who is our theater teacher. And inside the technical theater, there are four pieces: sound, stage, props and costumes. Ms. Lemons will teach the props and the costume units, and Chad Summers, our voice of the Huskies, will teach the sound and stage. And very much like Mr. Bibb, he will, Mr. Bibb will have students accompanying him in that sports medicine shadowing program. Chad Summers already helps us with sound and stage for our theater productions, but students will be with him to assist him in the stage crew. And so if we're running short, if he's out of town, eventually, if this goes well, we'll have a stage crew to go in and help at the middle school or at the high school for our theater productions. And it will be students. So they'll get the credit course and it could lead to a career. So it's part of career readiness. How's this going, guys? Is this going to fit in under the, uh, under the theater, theater, fine arts? It comes in with our theater uh, class, technical theater. There might be a student who really does not want to act or sing or dance, but they really are interested in the technical theater side. So they're in the sound, they're in the sound booth. They're operating lights and sound. And I, I can relate to it. I mean, it is, it is a, it's a specialty. I had the opportunity at church campus just two weeks ago to help run the just the PowerPoint slides for the for the music, and I I loved it. I, I I'm not on stage. I'm not on stage singing, <laughs> but I had I felt like I was a part of it. I mean, it, it, I can totally empathize with that. I mean, I have the niece right now at Belmont. She's not going. She's going for the technical part. You know, that's what she wants to do. So. <laughs> Look, well, look, it's really, you're at the back of that. Nobody can hear you. Nobody can see you. You can sing all you want, and nobody can hear you. That's what I was thinking. Well, that's, that was my problem. I get caught up in singing, and I'd be sick, so I'd run. I'm a volunteer. I wanted to volunteer. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, and I look forward to seeing which students uh, tap into this. I think this is a way to really engage students. Um, also, we are so proud of Mike Gusman. Our, our, I still call him the new band director, and he's expanding our wonderful program. Uh, Brandon Peters is here today, and they work so well together. And, and Mr. Gusman came to me with an idea to expand uh, the band program, and we are. And I want him to kind of tell you about a little bit about percussion and jazz and all the plans you have for uh, the new band assistance. So come on up. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for inviting us to speak a little bit about our program and keep everyone up to date on the happenings and achievements of, um, of our program as well as some of our future plans. Uh, first, we want to discuss our, the new unit, the new band director unit. Uh, we want to thank Dr. Neal, uh, Mr. Kirkland, the CCS uh, Board of Education, and our uh, Hewitt Trustful Middle School and High School principal, Mr. Salem and Sabney, for supporting our band program and vision and allowing us the opportunity to obtain a much needed assistant band director unit for both the middle school and the high school. Uh, we're excited to welcome Ms. Shannon Moore uh, as a new assistant uh, director. She's actually 
I'm in the process of moving from Colorado. Uh, so I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to meet her soon. Uh, she's an experienced middle school director, uh, has high school assistant band director experience, as well as a head director experience in Colorado and in California. Um, the addition of this unit will serve the middle school and the high school and further advance us on our mission to maintain a top tier national level six through 12 band program. At the high school, Ms. Moore uh, will teach one of the three concert ensembles one of the uh, two jazz ensembles as we expand our jazz portion of our program. Uh, she will lead our band lab program and assist with marching band and team teach uh, with Mr. Adair and myself. At the middle school, uh, she'll be teaching uh, beginning clarinet class, team teaching the beginning percussion class with Mr. Adair, and uh, team teach with Ms. Mr. Peters and Ms. Lewis uh, in several other classes. Uh, yeah, we're, just, we're so appreciative for uh, this expansion of our uh, staffing and our program. So uh, we just certainly appreciate all of you for uh, you know helping us to do that. But at the middle school, we had a great year uh, in our band program. Uh, we uh, currently are going to offer seven specific beginning band courses uh, uh, during the school year, and then three upper level seventh and eighth grade uh, band courses. Um, this past school year, we were able to um, return to in-person performances, and I know that our parents certainly appreciated all of that, uh, getting to see their kids, and so that was really great. Uh, we had a great year. Um, the kids excelled in a few different ways. We had uh, all three of our upper level groups earn superior ratings at the state band assessment. Um, we had uh, about 11 students to place into the district honor band, which is the uh, recognizing the, the top musicians in the metro area, and then one student to place at the all-state level. Um, this upcoming school year, we're going to have around 380 students involved in band at the middle school, uh, which is an increase from this past school year. Um, I'll start my 15th year here at Trusted City Schools. It doesn't really think those have been here that long, but, uh, and then Ms. Lewis and I will start our ninth year together team teaching, so the middle school is really exciting. Um, we're going to add another section of beginning band this year. Uh, we're moving to an eighth period day at the middle school. We're going to do this when we go. Um, uh, but uh, we're going to add that extra uh, section in there to be able to reduce our class size and uh, be able to uh, really reach our students in a little bit better way. Um, and uh, we're just looking forward to this school year. I think this is going to be uh, now we're moving into uh, with the mindset of most things are going to be as normal and uh, we're going to be able to bring back some things we haven't been able to do since 2019. So uh, we're really, really excited about that and uh, look forward to the future of. Uh, Staffing that we have in place now. Do our numbers look the same as they have in the past as far as well, students? Well, prior to prior to, um, to 2020, we had a few more. Uh, but well, as we all know, the 2020 year uh, was pretty detrimental to a lot of our programs, you know, across the school system. And so um, we're, we're slowly building that back. Yeah. Um, at the high school level, um, we are going to be offering three uh, three levels of concert ensemble, concert band, symphonic band, and wind ensemble. And these ensembles will range in ability uh, from high school level repertoire to collegiate level repertoire. So we're really proud of that, that we are, um, some of our students are leaving our band program and then going to Alabama and playing the same piece that we just played. So that's a pretty cool thing for us. Uh, this year we'll be expanding our jazz program and we'll be offering two levels of jazz band, uh, beginner level and advanced level. Of course, uh, the competitive and entertaining uh, Marching Husky Band will continue its winning tradition and field exciting and relatable shows while exposing our students to modern rehearsal and show concepts. We also want to thank uh, Dr. Neal, Mr. Kirkland, and the board, uh, um, as we'll be wearing our new uniforms. So we want to thank you for supporting us in that. Uh, for the first time, our band lab courses will have an actual curriculum designed uh, for student advancement and chamber music, specifically in chamber music. Uh, we, have a, we have been experiencing growth in our percussion area with the addition of Mr. Adair. He's been a great addition to our program, both at the middle school and the high school. And he's uh, developing and expanding our program by adding three concert percussion ensembles at the high school, corresponding with each of our concert band classes. These groups performed an all percussion concert in May and will continue to afford our students an opportunity to study percussion at a very high level. In addition to these concert percussion ensembles, Mr. Adair developed the HT Indoor Percussion Ensemble, which won the Alabama SEGC State Championship in their first year and received the bronze medal in the Southeastern Championship. Wow. Very impressive. So uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, finally, Mr. Adair and Mr. Peters uh, have continued to further the development of the beginning percussion program at Hugh Trustful Middle School. 
Um, last year was a pretty exciting year uh, for the Wind Ensemble, which is our top performing concert band. Um, we performed at the Alabama Music Educators Association Conference for the first time. This is the highest concert performance engagement in our state, and now both the middle school in 2018 and the high school have been selected to perform at the highest event in our state. Um, our Wind Ensemble also had its first two opportunities uh, on the national stage. Uh, first being selected to perform at the Bands of America Music for All Southeastern Regional in Atlanta, and second for being named a state winner of the Mark of Excellence National Wind Band Honors Award um, by the National Foundation for Music Education, uh, an honor that the middle school uh, won in eight, 2018, and now we have as well. So uh, both of our programs are nationally recognized in that uh, through that organization. Um, finally, we're proud of all three uh, middle and high school bands, like Mr. Peters said, for earning straight superior ratings at the Alabama uh, Bandmasters Music Performance Assessment. And just in closing, um, I just want to take a just want to say how fortunate I am uh, to work as part of this team of band directors because we really, really are a team, and I think it's the best team uh, of band directors in the state of Alabama. Not only do we work well together, but we always strive to help each other and improve and make our students' musical journey a top notch. And enjoyable experience. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Neal, Ward, and uh, the fellow directors uh, for allowing me the opportunity to serve as a member of our team. And thank you for having us today. So, if you have any questions or what have we done to see you? Oh, we put we had them out online already. So yeah. So um, we've I've gotten nothing but great reviews about it. Um, so we can we can go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll send who we can send it to. We can send it out to the board. Sandra. Okay, I'll, I'll send you the, the mock up for that. So we we did a, a couple of things we we have obviously an artist sketch, but we did a photo shoot. We got some seniors together and we wanted them to see it first. The, the initial plan was to uh, have the uniform and show it to our kids first, but the truck literally pulled in two days after school and everybody was out. So we gathered some of our seniors and uh, we had a, a band parent that was a photographer and did a formal photo shoot. So we'll send that out to you. We, we posted it on our band website. Um, we've posted it on uh, band Facebook as well. So we got the word out to our, our folks. So we're pretty proud of that uniform and we look forward to performing in, in style. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Mr. Walker, would you say another word about sports medicine? No, I was just, just going to uh, talk about Mr. G and Brandon. I just wanted to say from athletics how enjoyable it's been to work with both of these guys, uh, the support that they give us, and you know, so many projects and, and events we have to work together on, and uh, their communication has been great. So thank you guys for appreciate it. It is absolutely a thrill to offer these new programs that have such stellar people working with our students. It truly is a, a culture of college and career living. And your program will yield even more scholarships for students at the college level. This is like a mini collegiate program. It, it is, as we always tell our students, that music from middle school on up is a tool that they use uh, to, for college. Whether they're majoring in music or not, the universities want to have musicians. Uh, football games and so the phones opportunities for scholarships at multiple levels. So and it all starts at the middle school. Once it's so. Thank awesome. you. Any questions about the new programs, the three new programs? Just discuss. That concludes that section. Thank you. Thank, you, so, thank you all. Um, while we queue up the video of the basement at HTHS, we have a, a um, it was a new discovery for me. Uh, Mr. Kirkland knew about it, and Dr. Berry knew about it, but we've discovered 7,500 square feet of basement that we can use for labs. And before we play the video, uh, the video is a, a, a video of the 7,500 square feet of base, unfinished basement below the band room. What's that proportion? Like, what percentage of that is total high school or something? It's, it's under the fine arts wing. Under the fine arts wing. It's not the entire financial opening, but a vast majority of it. Wow. Okay. And, and we, we are at such an exciting place in Trustful City Schools. We are growing and, and we are going toward a, even a higher level of excellence. Let me just say that Mr. Bibb doesn't have a classroom. Okay, Mr. Salem's classrooms are full. You met Mitch Bibb just now. 
he'll be teaching a class for another teacher at planning time or wherever he can find a spot. But we have the potential to renovate the basement on, on a fast track right now. It's a one year project, five, nine, uh, to, nine to 12 month project, which means we could gain these classrooms downstairs if we can go ahead and get started. So the only teacher we will have floating is Mr. Bibb. So any new teachers that come in in any other department will have to what you call float. We're not having to do that yet. So just take a look at the video. I think it's about two minutes long. It's just it, we, rather than get on a bus and go there, yeah. we just we'll go ahead and play it, and we'll talk about what, what we can do with that space. You should be narrating, Jim, or something like that. It's coming in from the outside. There's some theater storage, lock walls, gravel floors. Those are props, theater props, gravel floors. Uh, electricity is already run. You see the, the light, fluorescent lighting. Sequins look really cool, too. They are. Those are the video is actually deceiving that they're much higher than what they appear on the video. They're, very high ceiling. Just forgot that these existed, I guess. Did we just forget that this is down there? I didn't know about it until Jim Kirkland and, and Dr. Berry uh, said, well, and, and Mr. Logan, I'm going to bring up Mr. Logan as well. Um, we're looking at um, it actually started with our tour of the Alternative Learning Center. And it just goes on and on. And Mr. Logan and Dr. Berry and Mr. Kirkland and I were, were touring new space for his electrical academy. And he said, I want the basement. And I said, what basement? And he said, the basement under the fine arts wing. And Jim gave it a nod and Dr. Berry gave it a nod. And I said, take me to the basement. And so what we want to do uh, in preparation for next year, we'll be standing at the retreat, we'll be talking about new classes for students. And the new class uh, is probably plumbing. And what will happen is Mr. Logan will take the Electrical Academy, and this will be designed for an Electrical Academy, not just a classroom. And we have a plumber interested in adding plumbing into our Construction Academy. Again, we're building the Construction Academy. We'll offer some new, new programs in the basement. But when Mr. Logan moves downstairs next year, we we'll free up a classroom upstairs. So we gain four classrooms in the main building, or maybe five. We don't have to design that. Four or five classrooms in the high school will be vacated as these move down into the lab. This will be 23, 24. But right, but that's a that's a great comment because right now it's we've got to get started on the basement to get it ready for 23-24. So if, if you want to see the basement, we can take you there. Don't worry about it. The cheapest improvement you can do is always your basement. So. Right, there you go. So um, we want to go ahead and have the it's called the HTHS renovation. And the uh, projected cost is on the capital plans. Kirk will help me out. Was it 1.7 million? 1.7 million. million. And talk about funding source for that. Um, well, the, the goal hopefully is to use our PSF funds from the state. Um, of course, depending on how it comes out, we do have some um, reserves from our 7 mil tax that we get each each year from, from the uh, leftover of the debt service. So between those two pots of funds, uh, we should easily be able to cover them. So, so basically it'll be a locally funded project and um, which kind of helps get through. So, so the TSF funds are, are available. And on your agenda, we're talking about available funds for the next discussion. So we're, we do have $10 million in a state leverage bond. 
and we have seven million in the city trust. But that's separate and apart from the PSF that we use for the HTHS renovation project. Right. So you have two point seven million comes up to what three seventy five, three eighty a square foot. I guess the answer that would be certain things you have to do to standards to build in that place. That makes it yeah, we, we do have to narrow down the scope of work uh, to it, but um, now. These are going to be more of lab type buildings versus. Uh, now, first of all, did you say 2.7? Oh, no, it's, it's 1.7. Oh. Uh, so it should be, yeah, yeah, it should be significantly cheaper. Um, and these are going to be more uh, geared to like a lab type of, it, it, It's not going to be the nice finished classroom that's in the rest of the building. I mean, this is it's going to be dirty. It's going to, you know, uh, it's a lab uh, for these type of classes. Construction but, classes. Um, yeah, so it's not going to be the personal effort cost will not be like uh, a full on building. Look, 1.7 is a whole lot better. Right. 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 Do you have to do like a back end to build bathrooms down there? Yeah. Well, we're looking at that. Um, we're we're, we're going to figure. Can you go back to that video? Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, please, yeah. yes. Okay, just stop right there. If you can blow that up. Sure. Right, there it goes. Okay. Um, you see the, the pipe going down the wall. Mm -hmm. When you're in zero floor and you, and you go out underneath the fine arch um, area, there's a double door and you go out to kind of a walkway that goes to the bridge that goes over where the band practices. I don't know if you're familiar with what I'm talking about. What we're wanting to do is, right as you go up the double doors, cut a hole into the wall, which will be along this wall, right by that pipe that goes down the wall. So um, the kids will be able to go into this area without ever going outside of the building. Um, and so if we do some restrooms, we don't know yet, uh, they will be right in this area because uh, you see the plumbing coming down the wall. That's the main plumbing for the building. So if we're going to do it, this will be the best time to do it. But that being said, as you go into the main building, there are some restrooms there. Um, but we got to check code wise as far as distance from you know the furthest point to a restroom to see if we can get away with not having a restroom there. But um, you know. Do you foresee any issues with COVID inspection by our hand? We haven't had that. We haven't looked at that yet, I see. Uh, well, I mean, that, that will be part of the design process. Um, under, um, it, it will have to go to the state for them to approve life safety. Um, of course, the, the trustful fire marshal will look at it for our local ordinances. Being a lab, uh, it doesn't have to be a um, um, storm shelter, shelter area, uh, although I mean, you can look at look at what it is. It's a very secure area. We will be right now. There's just one small little door you saw Mr. Salem go through. Um, we'll cut a um, like a garage door for. Um, well, it's been sitting there for several years. Now. Oh yes, so ever since the building. I don't know if there's any deterioration of anything yet. Then. Oh, well, there's nothing down there to do. Yeah. The floor ain't Not at all. <laughs> no, that's, um, we'll have to build it up a little bit because that's where uh, all the plumbing goes to the sewer system. Um, but uh, the the main the building's main electrical panels down there, so we'll have to protect that. But I mean, pretty much, it is bare concrete walls and gravel floor uh, with like. 25 foot ceilings. So it's it's prime for what we're wanting to do with it. It's prime area. So, uh, we, we will never get this cheap of an area. Yeah, this is great. It'll help with our growing pennies. I'd like to say it dropped out of the sky, but it's in the ground. So yeah, yeah. 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 We've we talked about no bathrooms. Great question, Kim. And, there, and then we've talked about possibly dividing this area and just put a family bathroom here and family bathroom. That, that, my only thought is just, if you ever don't use it, if you ever do decide to get classrooms down there instead of a lab, then 
then it's expensive to go to tear out and add a bathroom later. It's probably, I would imagine it's cheaper up front. But if you did something like that, like if you just said a, a one bathroom, just you know, one or two right there instead of the whole stall and all of that, that might work. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. We're, we're trying to minimize the bathroom because it isn't expensive in space. Yes. Yeah. But uh, to, to divide that corner where the plumbing already is and put in two family bathrooms. The, the teachers can use them, the students right. can use them. So, if theater is using it as storage, is that going to, are we going to still have enough room for that, or is it not that big a deal? Well, what, um, um, Mr. Logan is actually using an area in, in behind the theater to uh, have his electrical cabinet. And so, basically, the, the, when George moves uh, down, we'll just... they can have that area back, okay. which is what it used to be. Okay. But, um, you know, George needs height in his ceilings to, to do some of the things that, that he needs to do, which is why he's in the theater. Oh. You mentioned a possibility of adding plumbing, and that would be important, possibly for the reason. You mentioned that possibly that we'd be looking at, and this is way out of the road, but we'd, we'd be looking at the structure itself the plumbing. It would be a separate course. We right. have a separate course code for those students interested in, in learning plumbing. Uh, there is some carpet, carpentry involved in this, electrical involved in this, no plumbing yet. So we want to add that to this space and design it for our construction cabinet. And Mr. Logan can put up those furring strips, teach those kids how to shoot rock, and then take it down for the next year. It's not a really neat clean space. It's it's a construction space. Um, but it's it, it, old school silver I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's go let's go underground to all the schools and see. So we, we do have the funding source available in your board packet tonight. You'll see a contract from Lakeland and Associates to finish the design. Then you can see what the design might look like. But we're in the planning phase and we want to move it as quickly as possible because we need the space, we have the funds, and, um, and it is available. It's, it's there for us to use. So let's move on now to the capital planning part of the agenda on the work session where it states that other available funds, $10 million in state leverage bond. And that is um, a bond that we do pay back out of PSF funds, but we never see the funds. So there's there's no um, real payment to our budget. They just deduct so much to pay for that over, over the years. And so it's it's not like this building, we didn't have to pay any money back on this particular state bond. But on this $10 million bond, They'll, they'll just subtract from the funds they send us under the PSF category. And how much would that be for 10 million, Jim? It was $700,000. $700,000 a year. They just deduct. We'll never see it. We'll never see it. So uh, that's in force. It's ready to go. And then we, we still have $7 million in the city trust. So that equals $17 million to talk about. And what we have then before us at numbers two, three, and four is the C wing at the high school, which was bothering me because that's a two year project. We need some space now. So we're going to get some space from the basement, but we still need to go forward with C wing. Uh, we have an athletics master plan that Mr. Walker will present today, which is uh, very exciting. I've asked him to do it, he's done it, and it looks great. As we grow, we need to grow academically and athletically. We're already growing in our fine arts area, taking care of that. And then the fourth elementary school estimate is about 52 million. So to talk about the 17 million really excludes the fourth elementary school because we're not even close. We would have to refinance or, or figure out something else creative when that time comes. But it's on, it's on the capital plan. But we need to talk about C Wing first, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Walker to talk about the athletics master plan. So uh, you have a copy of C Wing options. I've spoken to 
uh, Ryan Varna and Jim Kirkland and Tim Salem about those options. And finishing the basement will give us a little more time to study options one, two, three, and four. Um, and you all have a copy of this, correct? I'm just going to go over these quickly. The original ceiling has the four floors with eight classrooms on each floor, and that mirrors A wing and B wing. That's it. That's where we've been for a long, long time. Now we're getting some classrooms underneath the basement, but we may or may not need option one. We just need a little more time to figure out what our growth is going to be. So option two is just a mini C wing. It is just two floors with eight classrooms. So that would that would be a zero floor and a first floor that would mirror zero floor and first floor uh, on A wing and B wing. Now the um, zero floor has to be a storm shelter. So the, the square foot cost of the zero floor is more expensive than the first floor. Zero floor has to be a storm shelter. So that's it. There are two options that we could finish if we spent the 17 million on option one, or if we spent 9 million on option two and had a little left over for the athletics master plan immediately. And those are finished spaces, and that's where the asterisks come in. Under the asterisks, with options three and four, there are shell floors. They are not finished floors, but they're under roof, so we don't have to raise the roof ever in the future. So we've looked at then um, options three and four with the two finished floors and either one or two shell floors under roof for future classrooms. So let me stop there and say those that's a wing with six classrooms instead of eight options three and four. So the question is why don't you just do eight classrooms and shell it in? And we we explored that option and it goes right back up to about 17 million. Didn't save us anything to really do that. So to cut off two classrooms on the end and to shell either one or two floors brings us some cost savings uh, that, that allow us to use the 17 million in different ways. We could spend 17 million and just do C wing and then have to figure out creative financing or some other way for athletics. Or we could do option number two and spend nine million out of 17 and spend some on athletics as well and so forth down the line. If we took option four, that's $10 million, leaving seven million for something else, athletics or whatever else we do. So the decision won't be made today, but I wanted to go ahead and present this with the available funds of 17 million to say that in the future, we'll finally have to decide what we do and when we do it and how we do it, and then creatively finance um, the fourth elementary school. So um, the decision won't be made today, but we'll analyze it based on the other half of the equation is Mr. Walker's athletics plan, the athletics master plan. And then knowing you have 17 million available and this, the state leverage bond has to be spent by 2024. Yes, majority of So we'll, we'll, we'll start some combination of projects um, pretty soon, but we'll also have a chance to study the growth at the high school to try to get a feel for exactly how many classrooms we might need. So are there questions about C-Wing before I turn it over to Mr. Walker? This is, a, this is a cost that we'll endure. We will, we will encumber this cost on the sheet of paper somewhere. And then there's an athletics master plan that I would like to fund for uh, some portion or all of what it presents. So, um, any questions on C? Okay, Mr. Walker, I'll turn it over to you to talk about the athletics master plan. Thank you for doing that. Okay, appreciate it. With this, I was going to try to take it by uh, kind of zone, one zone at a time, and kind of explain everything and then put it together. So, uh, Dwayne, if we could start um, 
of the field house area here. He's going to zoom in for us. So this, of course, is the stadium. This is our current uh, high school field house. So one thing that we've looked into on either side, we have two full hundred yard plus grass fields um, that are not used very much because uh, we practice football here. Um, so our idea concerning the field house, um, which is currently way too small. Uh, this year, grades nine through 12, we have 145 kids play football. So if you want to know what's coming up, just our second and eighth grade, we got 150 kids. So, you know, we don't have enough locker space, weight room, out of space, you know, all of that. So our idea would be to take up roughly half of this field here, which is the field closest to the high school, take up half of that with an expansion of a building. Um, the new expansion would have a weight room, uh, which would be mainly for large squad size sports. Um, thinking about football, track and field, soccer. Um, we have small weight rooms in the high school um, and in the baseball softball area that we have teams use. Uh, we would have restrooms in that area, meeting space, which we do not currently have, office space. Um, at the back of the new expansion would be a full basketball court uh, that we would use uh, for cheerleading as well. Um, if you think about a month like October at the high school, we have cheerleading, volleyball, boys basketball, and girls basketball. Those programs all practicing, four programs and two gyms. So we're in a situation right now where we tell kids to go home after school, come back at five o'clock or six o'clock to start practice. Um, so a gym on the back of that would help us uh, with cheerleading, a place to house mats, and also be an extra court for us uh, that we're always looking for. Uh, the current field house would stay intact. It would just be renovated and would turn into locker rooms, uh, enough to house everyone, and a training room. Uh, you met our athletic trainer, Mitch, earlier. Uh, we do not have an athletic training room there right now. We have a tape, but no room. Um, so that's what that would look like. The other half of this field that I talked about, um, our plan would be to have an open air practice area, uh, similar to what UAB has. Um, if any of you have seen that, so it would be basically a half football field turf. It would not be enclosed. It would have, you know, posts going up and a cover over it. Um, it would not be a true indoor. Again, this would help us uh, with weather issues. Um, in the past couple of years, we've had playoff games where that week we've had cancel practice, not practice a couple of days where the team we were playing was able to practice uh, because we haven't had any kind of covered facility to go under. Um, again, thinking about our other sports in January, February, when it's freezing cold, rain, and this is an area to go throw baseball, softball, kick a soccer ball, do something practice wise that we haven't been able to do before. So that's kind of our mindset for this area here. Uh, the field on the other side of the field house, we've been looking for an area to have an additional softball and baseball field. Um, in 7A, we're one of the few teams that does not have two fields per sport. Again, it's the same situation this year in baseball. We have four teams, middle school, ninth grade, JV, and varsity, they have one field. So we were having to stagger four practices throughout the afternoon and night. Uh, so this is the best area um, that we've been able to find uh, with the square footage to have a practice softball and baseball field in this area. Along with that, uh, would be a building that would just be bathroom and storage area. Uh, this would not be anything where we would need concessions, bleachers, any of that, just a true practice area, uh, one for baseball, one for softball. Uh, we, look, we worked with Ryan on the dimensions. We can put a full softball field there. Uh, the baseball field would probably be about 275 feet, so it would be, say, 100 feet less than a normal field, but that's about as large as we could fit in that area there. Um, Dwayne, if we can scroll kind of down the other side of the civic center here, right here, let's stop at the uh, soccer field. Uh, this is probably the, uh, you know, the location we've done the most work the last couple of years uh, with new locker rooms, bleachers, dugouts, et cetera. So 
the upgrade here would be to turf this field. Uh, again, from talking to our soccer coaches, having the asset access to one turf field and one grass field would be very beneficial. Behind the high school, we have two grass fields, one that the band uses, and then up at the top, uh, one we can use for practice soccer. Uh, so you know, when we talk about turf and the ability to not have to cancel practice, not have to cancel games, um, and have the option, um, that's part of this master program that we're looking at. Then if we'll uh, cross over the interstate, Dwayne, I think you're good uh, right here. Uh, several things that we're looking to do kind of in this circle here, uh, that we need a lot of help. Uh, this is the grass field behind the uh, middle school field house. So the idea is to turf this field, which is probably the most used field in the city of Trustville. It is in use from 8 a.m. every day for every PE class to afternoon practices to park and rec activities at night. It is in really bad shape. It is beat up just from uh, traffic. We also, use, we've been currently using this as kind of an extra practice area for baseball and softball. You know, the teams that aren't practicing will come over here and throw or warm up or do all that because we don't have another field. Um, so that's what we'd be looking at in that area. One thing that we've had an issue with in the past with baseball and softball is just uh, the security of the area because we have this kind of one way street right here that goes all the way around. Then we have another entrance here on the other side of the field that we go all the way around baseball. So we never really had a way to lock a game or have a time to open the games because we don't have a game. It's just sort of two fields sitting out there. So what's in the plan and our idea here is to make this one way foot traffic only. And we would put a couple of pedestrian markers, think about like almost like a brick you know, rectangle that would come up where you could walk on either side of it, but you could not take a vehicle down. Uh, so that would make this little strip walking only. Then right here, as you enter, we would have a marker on either side of the road, one for softball, one for baseball. And these would be decorative, maybe, you know, Hewitt Trust Ball, softball, home to state champions these years and these years, on the other side, the same thing as baseball. And then we would have a gate in between the two markers. So that now for the first time ever, you know, when we leave the field at night, we can lock the gate and secure that area. Or if we're having a baseball and softball game and we say, hey, the game is at six, we're going to open the gates at five, we can actually open the gates at five. And it'll just kind of dress up that area a little bit. In addition, back here um, on our plan is to turf the existing softball and baseball field. Uh, again, we looked at a ton of different options. We've looked at trying to put, make this a baseball field and put some, two softball fields somewhere else. And we've looked for places to put four fields together. Uh, but we feel like this is our best option right now, keeping everything where it is and um, putting turf down to, again, same thing, same as that we talked about with uh, soccer, just being able to use it every day. Um, so many of the fields that we play on now, we can play games on our turf. Um, so we feel like that works the direction that we So the sheets that you're looking at um, are kind of broken down. One of them is for turf, basically a, a total of six fields. So this would be the existing baseball and softball field, the soccer field, the field behind the middle school, which we call the multi-purpose field, and then the two new practice fields, one for baseball, one for softball. So that sheet kind of details those six things. The other sheet um, estimate for Lathan, that sheet will talk about the building areas. So we're talking about uh, the renovation of the current field house, the field house expansion, the open air practice area, and the new bathroom facility that would be with the new uh, baseball and softball practice field. So two different sheets, but added together kind of give us everything we talked about. So if we're looking at this as a whole, like how do you, how do you rate 
like products? I mean, how do, how do we do that? It's, it's all going on the capital plan. Okay. And, and I'm thinking if we find out the size of Seawing first, that gives us a balance to do this, or we look at it in a different way, but it's all on the capital plan for September. Okay. But I think you asked if you had to prioritize the 20 Yeah, I mean, we had to pick and choose, or, you know, I mean, it, it all goes on the capital plan, and then I guess, you know, Jim's the money guy. But how do we, I mean, is it, are we looking to do it all at once, or is it all just with pick and choose? I don't know if I asked that. I'm not asking which like ones are key and which ones are dropping. Yeah. yeah. I mean, are we are you hoping as you're in your athletic mind, you're hoping to do it all at once? I mean. No, well, I think um it would certainly take there would be a lot different uh, timelines. You know, right. when we're talking about turfing the multi-purpose building behind the middle school, I mean that could happen in a month or two. That's pretty quick. Whereas That's you know the Building expansion, we're talking about like we can't move out of our current weight room into the new weight room until the new one's built. So you're talking about a multi year kind yeah. of thing. Um, you know, the people that we talk to regarding turf, the more we do, the cheaper it is. Right, right. It's like carpet. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, that would, there just has to be planning involved in that when we're talking about timing because it's okay. We're talking about spring sports with soccer, baseball, and softball, you know, we would need it done whenever for January, which means during the summer or early fall, we got to be on the ground in those areas getting ready. Where a field like this that would primarily be used in the fall is on a different time. Right. So are you saying that you think the turf should go first, be first, and should find it and it should open some? Well, yeah, it's it's hard to say because um, you know we're probably in the same state in all those areas. You know, it's all a, none of this is kind of a you know just huge wish. I mean, it's all it's all a need. You know, when we talk about the the field house area, you know, I mean we're beyond packed there. Um, you know, the thing about that we're trying to think about with this too is the number of kids and teams that it affects. You know, right. We're talking about the field house addition, and you're talking about weight room, the number of people that can get into that, the gym, the gym being on the back, the gym being on the back of that. Now we have a positive effect on cheerleading, volleyball, boys basketball, girls basketball, on down the road. Um, so when you said that about the did you say a court or a basketball court, you're talking about like would be covered. So Correct. The gym. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then the open air thing, I'm saying you have these, it's open, but you're still in practice during implement weather. Yeah. Correct. I know what the locker rooms look like because I've been in there, you know, it's pretty small for the number of kids we have. Yes. So let me ask you this since we've just done all those projects on the weight room at the baseball field and all that, is that meeting our needs? Are everybody can be happy with that? I mean, do you think that's adequate to do a that's only what, a couple years old, two right. years old. Yeah, I think um, the weight room there has been very helpful, and it's really only baseball and softball that are using it. Right. You know, we have two really small weight rooms and zero four at the high school. Mm -hmm. So that those are primarily used by small squad sets in volleyball, basketball, wrestling, some. Um, so it's the bigger groups that I can see needing the new weight room. Yeah. Um, it's, really football, track, soccer, those groups that are going to be in there. So, you know, I think in maybe to help answer your question here, um, you know, part of our plan is doing some work at the softball field. Their locker room area um, is too small. Uh -huh. um, so we need some help there. I would say from a fan perspective for, you know, all of us to go to games, the softball seating bleacher configuration is the weakest that we have of any sport. So, you know, part of that is what you're looking at too. Um, you know, we need some help, but I think weight room wise, we're okay. Okay, so I've got a few questions. Um, Jim, you know, I think the softball and the baseball thing, 
I just feel like it kind of shoved in the corner. I mean, and I don't know how that how you fix that, but I definitely think that it needs some work. And I know that the, I know that the baseball community has expressed a real desire for there to be turf and, and all that. I guess my question for my first question is about turf. I mean, like, where do you start and where do you stop? Because I mean, I would imagine. Haven't I heard that in our football stadium that, that we have to re turf that every so many years? But is it, is it that like on the, a couple of years away from it needing to be done as well? I mean, do we not just as well go ahead and you know, turf it all while we're turfing? I mean, it, it, right. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, the turf at the stadium, you know, what they tell us is it's 10 to 12 years use. So we got it in 2014. So we're roughly two to four years away from having to do that. And, you know, when we were brainstorming about all this, we actually asked them, could we just take the turf up and put it on one of these spots? Mm -hmm. And uh, they wouldn't do that for insurance purposes and things like that. Um, from a financial standpoint, when we, when we looked at the stadium, what we paid to have it turfed and then what it would cost to redo it, it's about a quarter of the initial cost. Because so much of the cost on the front end is everything that's going on underneath. Um, so when you when that time comes, you're really just replacing the carpet on the top. Um, so it's you know the numbers that we would be looking at on soccer, softball, and baseball uh, would obviously be the highest that we would ever pay. And you know, ten or twelve years from now, it would be a fraction of that. But you know, it's heavy on the front end. My other question deals with. Uh... Like with the, the, the facility over where the building house is. I mean, yeah. how let's be honest, like over there. Let's be honest. Like, how realistic is, is it that somebody over the football is going to get to use that weight room or get to use those facilities? Because you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how how open it is for it's going to be for say girls soccer to go. Like, I got a soccer player. I mean, is, are they really going to get to use that? Are they going to get? To use some other facility that now they're not allowed to use because someone else. You see what I'm saying? Right. Like it's one thing to say we're building this nice facility, but and for other sports, but are they actually going to get to use that, or are they not going to get to use the small weight room in the gym because now that's freed up for the football team to go to speak for mm -hmm. I do. Yeah, you know our current weight room is used by more than football. Um, I know Coach Harry's taking over groups so there, and track has been in there. It's mainly been the large squad size group. So, yeah, I think we have to maybe to answer your question, we have to be smart about how we title this. This has to be That's an athletic. Right. This has to be an athletic facility. Um, that it's we, only half a play. It's football. Yeah. It's, it's it's an expansion of football at Hillhouse. Right. And that's why that's why part of where I'm coming from is yes, yeah. I think um I think that needs to be titled something different. Um this is the Hewitt Trustful Athletic Facility. Um, but you know, especially in the summer, there's so much time, you know, we would just have to plan it out. Now, what we're talking about weight room wise, uh, we should be able to get more than one team in there, you know, because we're talking about 32 racks. I mean, it's over twice as big as what we currently. Um, you know, I see the open air area as being something that multiple sports use as well. Again, if it's you know February and it's pouring down rain outside, somebody like soccer can go in and have 50 yards of cover to do some kind of practice. It may not be like a normal practice, but it's better than what we've been doing, which is not um, the same with baseball or softball, just being able to get under a cover area. So yeah, I, I think it's a good point. I think we need to be smart about how we title it. I mean, essentially, it, it could be a multi-purpose facility. If you've got the, the a gym, yep. and you've got a field house with a weight room, and you've got a, a covered outdoor facility, then I mean, like it really could be a multi-purpose. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to tell it as multi-purpose, we got it. We got to use it as as well. And that's that's yeah. Oh, I know. My soccer player gets sent to the gym a good a good bit, and we're sharing a gym with other people and. and you know, it'll get the weight room because the boys are in the weight room. You can't have boys and girls in the weight room at the same time. You know, I, yeah. we're gonna we got. I was just that's my that's where my driving concern is. Well, if it's truly a multi-purpose, we've got to make sure that it's used there. Otherwise, we'll get blasted. The same thing like when cheerleaders when we first built the stadium, they said the cheerleaders had a room. That's just a visitor locker room. They really didn't have a place to practice. You know, deep down there. Yeah, so you see, and it's cold, so that's why they went down. They left 
that the house will be pressed with music will be great with the songs you hear. And so it would be great if the cheerleaders can have an actual place to practice, especially for competition to go to the next step. But then make sure it like can say the labels. Labels say it. Yeah, because you know, having having a gym on the back of the yeah, game, yeah, guys, it, it impacts cheerleading, but it also impacts volleyball and basketball. Right. Because whoever doesn't go to the new gym now they're starting to practice at 2 30 instead of 5 Um so it, you know, really with everything that we talked about, there's very few of our sports that wouldn't be impacted somehow, even though we haven't talked about anything specifically for volleyball. Having an extra gym with volleyball community or cheerleading being there where volleyball's in the high school gym, it's impacted them. Mm -hmm. and, and when the the turning of one of the other one of the other buildings, I guess I call it the crossroads, I think it's the name. Mm -hmm. right. that one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So turning that one into would that be a, a facility that would be designated, okay, this is where the middle school is gonna come over and practice, and the high school is gonna go over to the high school field. Is that kind of how that would which kind of is a problem because you kind of wish you could switch them because it's on the high school campus, but right. I imagine that's more than you're going to be here for the middle school. Right. Yeah. It's, um, you would be kind of up to the baseball and softball coach because it might be okay today we have a varsity game at Uber. So now the middle school team is going to practice here. But on another day, we got multiple teams practicing. Now one of them's going to go there. And, you know, we have to think about it's the transportation aspect of that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and again, this area is not large enough to have two competition fields. Like uh, Ryan's worked some magic to get a practice baseball and a practice softball field in there, but there's not any room for bleachers and concessions and you know all the other. Um, so it would just be it would just be two practice fields. My last question, sorry, it is involving the the far. On Norris Farm, right where, where the, the two other fields. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to get to those without Scroll up here. involving a car? I mean, is there any way um, to get from the high school over there, or is there a way that we could build a little bridge or something to get them? Yeah, you can uh, you can walk over the bridge right here and then walk up this sidewalk and you can get there right now. Okay. What are those fields? Is it, is it, this is the is one the that the band uses, and this is a uh, what we call like a practice soccer field. Um, Cause again, you know, right now we have four soccer teams in one field. Okay. So this is an area of practice. Now up here, we do not have lights or bathrooms. So it limits what we can do. Okay. But yes, you can, you can currently walk up there. From the hospital. Mm -hmm. It's not. Is it a little snaky? <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little uphill. Dwayne, scroll over here by this church for me. Keep going over this way. Um, yeah, so right now people are parking here, kind of on the edge of this church and walking across right here to get to it if they're going by car. Well, I've had to drive in there. It's, it's a little bit, it's muddy and, and stuff like that. Yeah. We're going to use it. We might want to put some gravel or something in there. But I, my concern was just, you know, my 14 year old get in a car with a 16 year old drive to drive around there. It's not far, but she can walk. I'd rather than just walk across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not made aware of the existence of a bridge. I was told that the only way to walk to get there was to try to get Yeah, it's a good trip. It's, yeah. it, it's all what? Yeah, yeah it's, 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 a, it's uphill. Yeah. It's, I mean, my, you know, because I mean, my son played soccer for four years. And at that time, it was the boys that, that practiced there, the girls practiced in the competition field. But it, it, there, there is a lot of limitations to this. I mean, it's good for practice. Pretty much that's it. Um, you know, the, the old mayor would never let us use this because of public access to it. Um, I mean, the church has been nice in letting us park in. You know, we're actually using their parking lot, walking across their property. And we put a fence up there last summer to kind of keep some of the people from vandalizing the field. But, um, you know, it, it needs, if we're going to, um, but 
That's a long trip from the hospital student parking lot. You can't get there. And soccer players are in better shape than probably most people. Okay. Uh, it's a trip. I don't think any of them walk it. I don't think any of them walk it. So back to the field house, those two fields, and it's been a while. So nothing goes on either. You see the lacrosse is on the left one? Yeah, no. And nothing's on the right? No, not, not really. We'll, um, you know, we might have some of our kickers up there okay. kicking a little bit, but it's. Um, used to, both those used to be used for practice. So are all the football teams practicing at the stadium? Correct. Uh, you know, we our ninth grade has morning practice. So oh, the okay. ninth grade players have first period football. So okay. they'll practice before school and during first period at the stadium and then in the afternoon with varsity. And then you know, both the middle school teams are still down here behind uh, the middle school. On that field behind the middle school. Correct. And of course, this field, the top field right here, is now tennis courts. Tennis courts. And we still have this grass field as well that's, you know, a couple of feet underneath right there in the middle school. So we have two old grass fields right here. Well, okay. It's a great thing. It is a great thing. Yeah. We just want it all. And we're just going to put it all in the capital plan and chip away at it as we can. I think my birthday is probably the best thing you can do. I mean, that's pretty good. I'm like, just going to put that little bill right there. I'm just going to put it for first. <laughs> yeah, you know, the funny, the funny story about this deal right here is like, you know, everybody writes about it. It is the worst deal that we have. And when we had COVID and we were shut down in March 2020, you know, of course, we weren't allowed anyone to go to the fields. I walked by here like one day in May and it was like the best looking field. <laughs> for the first time ever, it didn't have a chance to breathe. So it is, uh, it's used a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Lance. Thank you. On the uh, strategic plan, the three areas are determined by Conmega. Dr. Barry is here, and I'm so glad because. She is our lead cognia expert. And what you have before you are the strategic domains labeled Roman numerals one, two, and three, which come directly from cognia. And then the uh, standards are on the back pages for uh, a number one, two, and three. So you have then the cognia uh, capacity standards and then the, the, learning, the learning standards on the next pages. So, under leadership capacity, the personnel responsible for helping achieve those standards for our next Cognia accreditation visit or cycle. Uh, leadership capacity, Dr. Neil, Dr. Barry, Phoebe, Mr. Purple, Mr. Gaston, Ms. Chamberlain. And then you can see learning capacity and the person who's responsible from the leadership team there and resource capacity um, listed as well. So if you look at the back two sheets on our last accreditation cycle, uh, they, they labeled um, everything in color codes. And green and blue is good. So you want everything to be green and blue. Um, yellow is the caution light. It needs to be looked at and needs to be improved. And then red is, it is terrible. We didn't get any red bars. So that's a good thing. Um, we're, we're proud of our teams for doing that. And, and some of these um, yellow bars were things that were in force, but they weren't in force long enough to get credit for them. So Dr. Barry, you can help me out here. I think they had to be in force three of the five years. Right. And if it was in, if, if, and it, this did happen, if we had an initiative during the five year period and it wasn't working, so we scrapped it. And we started a new initiative that was working, but we only had that initiative for two years or one year. It didn't count. And we begged to differ on that strategy because if you have an initiative 
it's not working, you don't want to keep for five years. But the expectation is that you would have something at least three years to get credit for it. So we, we don't feel that we need quite as, as much work in certain areas because we have initiatives that are working. And they did change the cycle to a six year cycle. So we have one, I guess, because of COVID, we have one more year this time around to do that. So um, we'll go forward with this for the 22 23 school year, unless you all have any questions about it. Yeah, no, you hit it on the head. I, you know, again, just kind of remember, take us back in time. You know, we, we did all of this through the height of COVID, which I think is pretty pretty amazing. Um, because that surely was just a different experience in and of itself. So, and thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Anything during COVID, right? Yeah. So now, why they go to six years now? I mean. Yeah, um, that part I don't know. Dr. Malcolm commented, they were able to speak about that to you guys in the USSA conference, but I haven't heard the rationale for that yet either. They did mention the visit would look different, and then we have uh, people assigned to us to walk us through the accreditation cycle rather than have no one and then suddenly a visit from a team. So I think they're in the process of assigning people to school systems right now. And they need a little extra time to reorganize. So, um, yeah. Okay, um, let's move on to paid meals, and um, I'll just say before we, before we get to the details of that, that our CNB specialist, Morgan Bean, had a baby boy. She fell in love with him and staying home, mm -hmm. and so we have a new CNP specialist. She'll be introduced in just a few minutes, um, but I do want to say that for two years, We've been under a COVID relief assistance plan where all of our students ate breakfast and lunch for free. And Congress is not funding that. The U.S. Congress um, price tag of that is $3 billion for every U.S. student to eat breakfast and lunch free. And the question was, will they extend it or will they let it expire? It expires June 30th, which is Thursday and they are not extending it right now. That means we go back to what we would call pre-COVID processes and pricing. So our pre-COVID prices for each grade level for breakfast and lunch are on the screen. And we will roll this out in July. We were waiting until after June 30th to see if anything might happen at the federal level. You never know, things can happen overnight. Um, and our process is the same for applying and becoming eligible for free or reduced lunches. So um, we will roll out the full price schedule and probably include reduced prices as well. And keep those just like they are unless something changes at the federal level. There was, there was noise about but doing away with reduced price lunches and having every student either eligible for free lunches or not. So they would either be fully paid or free. And I don't think that's going to pass either. So we'll roll out our original reduced price and we'll give it, um, we'll give the parents as much lead time as possible. But right now it looks like 90% um, of our students, if the stats stay the same, will be paying for the lunches. The 10% will be in the free or reduced lunch category. Or if more families are eligible and they fill out an application, that could change. So the pre coded number is about 90-10. So we, we do need to get that word out as a heads up and then the official word coming out. And you all are welcome to address that during your part if you want to defer anything new or whatever we we'll rely on the, the edge here with the exploration of that. The last thing I have, and we'll, we'll run pretty much on time, a little few minutes over, is legislation. And they gave out the legislative packet at the school superintendents conference. And just the cliff notes of this entire packet uh, cover about four areas. 
number one, uh, discussions about transgender or changing gender in grades K through five is not allowed. So if students have a question about that, they, the answer is supposed to be uh, go home and ask your parent and about that. Um, I don't know why that, that occurred. Apparently there was some disagreement on what advice was being given. So we're not going to get involved in that. We're going to try to concentrate on reading, math, science, social studies, and academics in grades K through five and not get into those discussions. Um, the bathroom bill uh, was passed by the state legislature and it states that students will use the bathroom assigned to their gender on their birth certificate. That is a, an Alabama state law. So that answers questions about which bathroom can I use. We still have the sex. We have family bathrooms. Family bathrooms. Mm -hmm. We do. We have family bathrooms. For, you, for anyone that wants to use them. Um, whether there's a question about their gender identity or not, if they need to use the bathroom and they're near a family bathroom, they can use them. Uh, the Numeracy Act is new. Dr. Berry will talk a little bit more about that in her section, but it is that there's a competency test for fourth grade in mathematics, but there's not a retention piece. The Literacy Act came with a reading test and a retention piece in third grade. And this looks a little bit like it, but they won't be retained in fourth grade if they don't pass the test. Uh, the opt-in for mental health I've already talked about. If any of the areas in the um, DSM-5 manual are identified by the counselors, we'll call the parents and we'll hook them up with a mental health counselor or an agency that can help them with the mental health issue. And the last one is the 4% salary increase. That was legislation for um, the salary increase at 4% and on the teacher scale there was an increase in step levels. Um, that 4% for everyone is, is part of the legislative act. And Mr. Kirkland will go over that a little bit as well in this presentation. So that concludes my part. Unless there are any questions for me, we can uh, turn it over to Mr. Kirkland or take a break and turn it over to Mr. Kirkland. Five minute break. Five minute break. And then Mr. Kirkland. Thank you. Thank you.
Before I introduce Mr. Kirkland, I just wanted to say one more word about the, the school lunches, the school breakfasts, and the lunches. And I wanted to say this really to our viewing audience and to the board. Every year, if you have if your oldest child starts kindergarten, you don't really know how to pay for breakfast and lunch and how to apply for free and reduced meals. This year, if your oldest child is starting kindergarten, first grade, or second grade, you've never paid for a school breakfast or lunch. So it's, it's a whole new process for those parents who have their oldest child in kindergarten, first or second grade. They've never done this before. Welcome to the early morning call that tells you you're overdrawn. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Mr. Orsco, please. He's our new CUP specialist. And uh, talk a little bit about the, the rollout of the program. So, Mr. Corbin, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, so we'll just stay with uh, CMP for a while. Um, like Dr. Neal mentioned, um, Morgan Bean has decided to stay home with um, little Daniel, who's the cutest little boy you can imagine. So um, we have recently hired Terry Coggins. Uh, we uh, stole her away from Aviana, and she is a trustful resident. Cool. Uh, kids went through our school system, so uh, she is one of us, even though she's new. Uh, so I would like to uh, introduce you, and if you want to say anything, you don't have to. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Thank yeah. you. I just want to say I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited to start this upcoming year. It'll be my 16th year in child nutrition. Oh, wow. Oh. Welcome kind of home, right? <laughs> yes, yes, and I'm excited about the job. Especially with gas. Yes. <laughs> um, one thing with, um, with child nutrition, it is a family-funded program. Um, we do supplement it uh, with some of the, uh, the same cause of the pass through. Uh, so we supplement the program a little bit, not much. Um, coming out of COVID, we had conversation, not knowing what the federal government was going to do with prices. We had conversation about what we should do with our the prices that we would charge. And obviously, we did not want to come straight out of everybody being free with a price increase in, 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 that parents would have to pay. So, the prices that Dr. Neal showed earlier were the ones that we had in place prior to uh, COVID hitting. Um, that being said, it's going to be a challenging year because um, that's the only thing in child nutrition that's staying the same. Everything else is increasing um, as everything we're doing, um, fuel cost has skyrocketed, food cost. So, um, you know, we will have to monitor the program very tightly, uh, monitor everything, but especially this program. So, um, you know, it'll be a challenging year. We will get through it. We'll, we'll adjust where we need to uh, adjust. And, you know, we always put the kids first and uh, we'll continue to do that and we'll get through it. Get my stuff and I'll turn the podium up again. <laughs> uh, Dr. Neal also mentioned the um, salary schedule. Um, it is on the board agenda tonight for approval. It was placed uh, on the um, table last week, last month. Um, we talked last month in depth about the teacher salary schedule, the changes made at the state level, and then um, basically what we would do is 4% raise, except the areas that, that didn't agree, and then we would match the state, state matrix on those upper areas. Uh, steps. So, uh, you know, like I said, we talked about that in depth last board meeting. The rest of the salary schedule for everybody else, we just did a straight 4% raise to match um, what the state um, mandated. So, that is what's being presented tonight. And um, is this representing any local increase at all? No, sir. it is just the uh, Given, given where we are in the economy, we just wanted to be kind of conservative and just just stay with what the state's doing. Um, this is a crazy time in 
um, finance because parts of the year we're in, I'm dealing with three different fiscal years. Um, talking about the salary schedule, that's for next fiscal year. Uh, the next two board meetings, we will have budget hearings. Um, don't have the budget done um, at this point. Although it's, I mean, it's looking some the budget. Um, but we will talk more in depth in, in the uh, July board meeting and then in August. Um, tonight, I have a, our final budget amendment for the fiscal year 22. Um, and, and as always, like we discussed, the budget amendment is not, uh, there's not a lot of changes in our budget. Uh, usually what it entails is I have to bring over the final balances from fiscal year 21 because um, when we did the budget, I had to estimate what we were starting. So now I'm rolling over the actuals. Um, and the biggest change, if you remember, and it seems so long ago, but when we started the school year, we started with Cali Services. Um, and then after a couple months, we decided to transition back to providing our own subs, the pay increase from the subs. So um, I had to do all these budget amendments to change it from services back to subs. So that's primarily the um, all of the budget amendments. Uh, some of the federal programs with um, some of the extra funds required some minor tweaks here and there. Um, but that's pretty much it. Uh, we are finishing the As the budget sits right now, uh, we will finish with a close, we'll write it four, uh, four months reserve in our local fund. Um, I do, however, expect revenues are tracking really good. Um, I expect to roll over around a million dollars. Uh, we're budgeting to roll over around between two and 300,000. I expect to roll over around a million. Um, so the payroll is tracking to where um, we'll finish, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in your budget revenues over. So together, uh, that that kind of always how I want to, you know, a couple hundred thousand here, a couple hundred thousand dollars there, uh, to to roll over a little bit each year. And um, so 2022 is no exception. I think we'll do that. So any questions on, on the amendment that we're pre presenting tonight? How did Roll Together amend this year compared to last year? Well, last year was a little stronger. Uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, we actually rolled over almost $4 million last year. Um, biggest reason last year is coming out of COVID, uh, I was extremely conservative in my revenue, uh, particularly sales tax. Uh, coming from the city and coming from the county. Uh, just sales tax alone, we almost $2 million by itself was just a sales tax. Um, so we're not going to do quite as good as we did uh, in 21. Uh, but I typically try to roll over you know, around between a million to two million. Uh, 21 was just an amount. I, I wish, I hope, <laughs> I, I would love to roll over uh, $4 million every year, but that's just not uh, reality. Um, speaking of 21, you have in your packet our, um, the annual audit. Um, we are required to, it's finally finished and we're required to present to the board. Um, 21 was probably one of the hardest years for everything uh, financially, it was uh, no exception. Uh, my 27 years is probably one of the hit franks in the top five. Um, but the audit has been released and presented to you tonight. Um, and so I do want to just kind of go over it. In my opinion, it's a great audit. Um, we, we try very hard here in Trustful, and, and I say this every year. Uh, this is not a finance thing. This is a trustful city schools thing. Everybody uh, works together. And um, when you look at um, 
what we bring in as revenue and what we get out of every dollar. I think we spend our money um, better than anybody. Uh, we, we rank in the top five every year in, in athletics and academics and everything we do, but we don't rank. There are systems that per dollar bring in a whole lot more money than we do. Uh, and, and we're competitive with them every single, at every single step. And I'm proud of that. And, and that, is everybody working together, every director, every principal, uh, trying to get as much out of every dollar and following the procedures that the board had put in place and, and that I ask people to do to safeguard our money, to spend it wisely, to spend it accurately. And those are reflected in our audits. And, and I'm proud of everybody for working together. I appreciate it because they make my job easier. Um, you know, we're a $70 million budget. And you know, um, you know, there obviously there are a lot more bigger school systems in the state, but that's a that's a lot of money that goes through us, and um, I think that collectively we do a really good job. And our the citizens of Trustful Life can be proud of how we spend their time. Um, there are three reports collectively in the audit report: a report on the financials. Report on internal controls and report on federal programs. Um, obviously, the report on financials is an unqualified opinion, which basically says um, that the financials represent what they're supposed to. Um, the, the financial reports look totally different from what you see month to month. Uh, these are presented on a cruel basis accounting. As I say every year, if you want more uh, detail on why they look the way they look, I'll be happy to work with you and explain. Um, I know it'd be a riveting conversation, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I'm always willing to do that for anybody who is, is interested. Um, report on internal controls basically says that during the audit process that they did not uh, come across any uh, deficiencies in our internal control processes that would create a problem. Uh, so that's a good thing. That means we have strong internal controls and people are following. And um, the report on uh, federal programs uh, just says that um, they did not find any it, instances of non-compliance. Um, basically, we complied with the regulations and program requirements that we were supposed to. So, yeah, it's, uh, Huge team effort, and I'm proud of everybody who uh, uh, helped us in this process. So, uh, great audit. Uh, we're proud of it, and um, you know, it, it speaks well for the school system. Jim, I think it's no surprise that we had a great audit. You are the captain of that ship, and we, I, there's such a comfort level there for me, and I'm sure everybody else that we we know. And you say it's a team effort, and I know it is. Everybody has to play the same game, but thank you so much. This is not a small thing, and we appreciate it and all your hard work because this is a big deal. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to give you a round of applause. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do you want to go on to the capital? Sure. Uh, we spent a lot of uh, the time today talking about um, capital plan. Do you want to do the do you want to fly over or we'll do it now? Sure. We're closing out the old one and talking about the new one. So let's close out the old one. The old one. It's page two of your work section. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or we can um, Obviously, the central office is complete. So uh, we, yeah. we're in there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, the tennis courts is uh, almost there. Uh, you want to start that drawing?
Uh, I mean, the pictures speak for themselves. It, it, it's really it is, you know, it's been a long, we're not quite done yet. Um, oh, but they, they really did a good job. Uh, there's some minor things that we've got to work through, but the courts are absolutely beautiful. Um, Lance and the coaches worked with architects and designed a unbelievable complex uh the two concrete paths that you see there in the middle um the bleachers are being built have you been by there today are they done i was not there yesterday they're in process of uh, putting the bleachers out they should be done after all the rain is done the building is about 99 percent complete there's a few things that we've got to work through in order to have a final inspection um, so that we can start using the building. Basically, the building is um, uh, boys and girls restrooms and uh, a small office room for the coaches. So it's it's almost there. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, it'll be done by the school starts, but they are practicing on the courts. They just can't use the building. Um, it's got to be grilled. I mean, yes. Okay. So, Lance, I, you talked about earlier, like dressing up the interest of the softball and baseball. And you and I talked years ago. I mean, now that drive this discourse, a lot of people drive back there, and that is just not attractive. I mean, have we thought about like improving it from the second you clear the middle school? I mean, I just love to see that dressed up. Because I mean, you think about it, that's the first impression so many people get. Now they're going to be going back there for tennis, softball, baseball. I'm not sure that putting the interest thing in softball, baseball is we have concern. You and I have this conversation. I mean, that that would just be landscaping, but it's not our, for the world class facilities. The drive back there is not that great. Yeah, I agree. You, you're right. There's some things about it. Think that. True. So we will have we did uh, we will have some signage for tennis. You know, if you're a Trustville tennis center. Um, that will help, but you're right, it's everything within the fence back there, within the fences are really nice, but I think there's a lot we can do outside the fences to make it a good experience for people coming in. That's a really nice, I've been to a lot of high school facilities when my kids play, that's a really nice, that's really nice. <clears throat> um, we will present the capital plan to the board to be approved later on in the uh, next couple months. We have to present a five-year capital plan. It's due by September 15th. Uh, so it'll be a more formal document than what you see uh, here today. But basically, uh, if if we use PSF funds for anything, it has to be on this plan. Uh, it's just a state requirement. So uh, that's why we're all always particular about uh, what we put on the plan that, that it is generally what we are. But you can kind of look, uh, Dr. Nell has already talked through a lot of the bigger projects that uh, we need to look at, the ceiling, the athletic projects. We have some smaller stuff that we need to get done um, that I don't want to say are as high priority. There's small projects, uh, carpeting, um, some mechanical units. We always have um, technology. Uh, Upgrades, uh, security upgrades. We're constantly uh, changing out our cameras. We have done a big upgrade and back on school security. Um, we have upgraded all of our cameras, and uh, but that's just every year thing. Um, we'll always be investing more money in, in better cameras as these go. Out of life, um, and uh, we are adding more card access doors. So all these little things have to be on the capital plan, and uh, you know, they have to be planned out over the next four factors. Again, we will present it more in detail yes. later on. Uh, but yeah, I will.
Um, the Oak Central Office Building. We are, thank goodness, out of. Um, you may or may or may not have known this, but the city actually owned that building. We never owned that building. So we turned it back over to the city and um, we're almost completely out of it. We have some uh, connections with uh, technology centrally that um, our connection is in that building right now. We're working on getting it here. Uh, but as soon as that's done, uh, the city is, will begin moving some of their offices in there temporarily while they do some construction. So um, you may see some people moving into that building. Thank you, Kenichia. Jim, you perfectly noticed that you know where you're going to go. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kirkland, for everything. Um, and and for that clean audit. It, it's always such a joy to have no time in from the audit. I just want to reiterate how thankful I'm for, for you and for those details. The details in there are just incredible down to that point. So thank you. Um, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Berry, I'm so proud of her to come on up. She'll present our curriculum and instruction items, and we have an outstanding academic program in large part because of her and her team. So I have just a few minutes and I wanted to share just kind of an update of what's kind of going on this summer, um, some data to share with you guys, what you won't see. We have um, we do have our ACAP summative scores as have been released, um, so to speak, to us for internal purposes. In other words, they're still embargoed, so that data will come later as far as a public review. And then also, um, ACT scores are still embargoed. But what I will say about those, um, I'm very pleased, um, especially coming out of COVID and um, what we were able to do as far as um, just all the, the initiative that we had to really kind of focus on our ACT. So I'm, I'm pleased about that. But what I want to do um, first is just kind of share some information. I think we'll have some summer school members joining. Go ahead and click that. Yeah, just a quick update on where we are with summer school um, with our numbers. And we're about to finish that up. Um, that's amazing. I, I don't, I, I say this, I've been saying this for the last few days. I, I just don't know where June has gone. It's crazy. Um, but we're about to finish. So we have um, 55 students that are participating or about to finish with credit recovery, um, 55 students in driver's ed. And then through our access courses, we have um, eight students in career prep A, 37 in career prep B, 59 in health, and 12 in Spanish two. So um, just a good, a good solid number um, for our summer school enrollment which is about to be finished up so all right quickly i want to talk about the psat and it was good timing with miss Abby walking in um and she she brought something with her today she's going to show you when it's her turn so i don't want to i don't want to spoil it but um we're really uh really proud of being a part of the a plus college ready grant for middle school which started last year so they've had one full year of implementation in the high school, we were just awarded that grant for this coming year, and it's a three-year grant, so we're really excited about that. And I wanted to draw some attention to um, the PSAT because as part of the grant, and you can kind of read this slide, one condition is for our seventh and eighth grade students to take the PSAT in the fall and the spring. And what is significant about the PSAT for most people is that's, that's the data that we use to determine our national merit scholars. And so it's really great that we're now really putting that emphasis on it at the middle school level. And um, I want to show you some data from that in just a second. I, I got a little wordy here, and I'll try not to just read all this to you, but I thought you might be interested in just kind of knowing a little bit about the test and what these middle schoolers um, sort of kind of had to endure. And think about it this way as well. They had PSAT really kind of like just back to back with ACAP. And so it was, a, it was a lot of testing for them um, this spring, but we're really proud of their efforts. And um, you can kind of just see the gist of this. It's a two hour and 25 minute test. 
And it basically includes three big chunks um, of reading, writing, and language, and then a math test. All right, and then that's just a breakdown of the number of questions and the length. So you can see that's a pretty, it's a pretty lengthy test, um, about 145 minute test, and then you know roughly 120 questions. So again, it's a it's a comprehensive test. Um, quickly, just to kind of break it down, you know, you might be thinking, of, well, what are they actually tested on as far as math? Well, there's a huge component on algebra. They call it the heart of algebra, but also some problem solving data analysis. And then um, they call this one passport to advanced math, which basically is they're manipulating equations um, and not just single step equations, complex equations. So it's a pretty intense test as well. Reading, uh, I won't read all of that to you, but I'll give you a minute to kind of process that. Um, there's, a, there's a literary passage that basically is, um, deals with fiction, and then also some nonfiction, um, and you can read some of the other sciences. So again, just a, a rigorous, uh, multifaceted test um, that really kind of, you know, has our kids thinking about different aspects, um, again, fiction or nonfiction. And then the writing language, uh, the four passages on the test are 350 to 400 words. Um, the complexity varies, okay, depending upon the passage. And the topics include science, careers, humanities, history, social studies. Um, so again, very diverse um, in terms of what, what it kind of requires our students to read. All right, so this is what I really wanted to get to. Um, because this is a this is something to really be proud of. So basically, what you're looking at, um, focus on just the eighth grade. They were given a baseline test. They took the PSAT in the fall, so that's what you see going across the top. So we had 352 of our kiddos take the PSAT in the fall, and then the spring 331. And really, what you want to look at here, um, basically, if we take the mean math and the mean, this is um, a reading and writing test. Those two scores combined give the mean total score, and you can see that ranges from 240 to 1440. So I just want you to look at the growth between fall and spring with those scores, okay? And then also looking at this toward, uh, toward the where I am right here, the percentage of our kids that met both benchmarks, okay, in math and um, in the reading component. Again, look at the difference there. And it's just, it's just really outstanding. And this is just one year implementing this curriculum, right? Um, and to see that growth. And so as a result, we had a challenge, right, Ms. Abney? I mean, we were challenged to, to, for our kids to basically grow over the 50 point threshold. And we didn't just meet that, we exceeded that. And so as a result, um, and she's gonna talk more about this, uh, we had some special recognition today um, in Tuscaloosa and that's where we work today. So very proud of our teachers, very proud of our administrators, um, our students, you know, just outstanding all the way around. And, um, you know, just couldn't be, couldn't be more happy to kind of get, like I said, get this test kind of out there in the forefront to really start identifying you know, these students that will potentially be our national merits uh, in the years to come. So it's pretty exciting stuff. It's, it's a huge percentage of growth. Yeah, and we were one, and help me with this, Ms. Um, we were, there were seven, seven of the nine pilot schools um, met or exceeded, and we, we exceeded. So we were super happy about that. Right. Yeah. Any questions about the PSAT, the grant, and I'm gonna let this out. I don't want to talk more about that, so you can tell um, kind of just the recognition. I'll steal her thunder on that, but um, we're very proud of everybody um, at that middle school for sure. Okay, so quickly, just want to talk a little bit about Ames Web. Ames Web is our approved, uh, state approved screener that we will administer to our K five students three times a year. What's significant about Ames Web? It is the screening tool that we use. Um, you hear about a lot about it with the Literacy Act, but we also use it for math purposes as well. Um, and I want to show you the growth um, in our K-5 population in not only literacy, but also in math. Um, so for this past school year. All right, so just quickly, we call this, or I call it, a Christmas tree. It's, it's really not a Christmas tree. I don't know why I look at that and think Christmas tree, but that's okay. Thank you. All right, so I call it the Christmas tree, and it's the best graph to just really give you a quick snapshot of where our kiddos are. And you can see by looking at the color combination that obviously 
tier one are kids that are at lowest risk. And that's really what we want. We want a solid green tree. That's the end game, right? And so yellow, those are kind of kids that we're going to be monitoring. Um, they're going to receive some tier two type things. They're probably going to have some intervention, maybe some tutoring. And then, of course, our tier three kids, they're going to have even a higher level of support. So um, kind of think about this color combination as you, as you go through this a little. All right, so we're going to start with kindergarten literacy. Um, if you look on the far, I guess right here would be kind of my left. Um, we do a fall, we do a winter, and we do a spring administration. Um, what you'll see at the bottom are the numbers, but again, for our purposes here and to limited time, really just look at the colors and what you want to see in that spring administration is more green than anything else. And that's exactly what we see here. Do we get to set our own like what what is what? Great question. Okay, so no, so this is nationally norm. So basically, it's at almost the 50th percentile is what they said the recommendation. So um, yeah, we're doing we're doing really really well. And this is just you know, it's our kindergarten kiddos, and you got to think about a little bit about that too. Is um, when we when we kind of they enrolled in the fall, a lot of those students again, COVID coming off of COVID, they didn't even really have preschool experience too. So it just goes to show you what you know what our teachers do and um, they're just so proud of so proud of our teachers as well. So a lot of great growth with our kindergarten students in literacy. I don't have to think too kindergarten, they're kind of all over the board. Right? Right. I mean so you got some coming that are sight, I mean just yeah. one words or whatever. That's right. right. Some of them that don't even know their sounds. That's exactly right. It's very um it is. You, you do. You have. You have students that can. You know, some some are even reading some some sight words, but some might not even know letter recognition. Right. You know, or the the Sound the phonetics sounds. are very important at that time too. Yep. Okay, and then this is just a breakout by school. I wanted you guys to see this and just kind of see um, the breakout by school, um, and this would be the final uh, administration of that. So this is basically spring data. We have Cahaba. Magnolia and then paint. It looks almost like triplets. Does then yeah. Okay, first grade. First grade, you know, they're kind of the ones that we're really keeping our eye on the ball with now because of the delay in the Literacy Act. It will be this group of kiddos, uh, our current, yeah, our current first graders that will really be Im impacted by the retention piece of the Literacy Act. And so um, you can kind of look at the fall again. Um, the standards change, it's more rigorous. Obviously, you know, every year, um, progressing from year to year, the standards become a little bit more rigorous, but ultimately we wanna look at that spring data and we're very pleased, very, very pleased um, at that proportion of um, kiddos that, you know, we we know who they are, we, we know what our interventions are. And again, going back to what we've talked about before, um, you know, we have our, these halftime interventionists in our schools and they're doing a fantastic job with kids. We also have some uh, after school tutoring. So we're really doing all that we can to support. And you'll see that this level of intervention is really, it's, it's paying off as we, as they get older, you're gonna see some different things in just a second with the graphs. Okay, and then a breakout by school. Again, very, very comparable. Um, you know, we talk a lot of times about just the fact that um, all of our schools do such a good job and you know just this year magnitude of numbers that came I just you know I just have a lot of students um, but they do a great job as well so we're very pleased um, and as a result you know we uh, we have our summer literacy camp which is about to, to wrap up right now we have our third grade since the primarily third grade and second graders uh, July, we'll have our first, uh, most of first and some kindergarten students as part of our literacy camp. But, you know, we had very few kids, very few third graders, very few third graders that let's just say if the retention bill wouldn't have been postponed by Governor Ivey, that we would even be looking at for retention. And when I say very few, I mean like 12. So that's pretty impressive um, across the board for all Okay, second grade, um, and so this is again looking at just the, the breakdown of colors and what you want to see um, by the time we get to the spring administration and that level of growth is just so impressive. And again, this would be district. Okay, Dwayne. 
And here it is a breakout by second grade. So I just kind of want you to go back in your mind, kindergarten, first, second, you kind of see where I'm going, right? With just how those, those gaps just continue to close. And that's exactly what we want to see. So very, very proud of this data. Okay, third grade, sticking with reading still. And then here's a breakout. And so this just speaks to what I was able to tell you that we have a very, very small percentage of students um, in that third grade. All right, fourth grade, look at that. I also wonder how many of those do you keep up with like the, like the third grade group that are either maybe they our school system. Or That's right. Or moved into our school system. Kind of know. Yes. Yes, um, we, we know who all these kids are, and, and you're exactly right. They really are. We've had a lot of um, students move into our district, and you, you do you have to meet kids where they are. And so um, a lot of times when we kind of put them through the first administration of the test, they, you know, we have, we have to work with those students, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but yes, they're not just, you know, students that might have been with us since kindergarten there's students that are moving into our district too that we have to meet them where they are to just do a great job of that would you like a drum roll for the next slide um did you already, did you already go ahead okay <laughs> <laughs> go for it okay check this out all right this is our fifth grade district reading oh, almost looks like no on my computer, so I know. My computer. yes <laughs> and then here's breakout of schools so you can kind of see the trajectory, you can, you can see the, the growth, um, and you know, it's just, again, something to be really, really proud of. Our teachers did such a good job, um, and they work really, really well with, with all of our students and meeting them where we are, and we have these strip meetings, you know, it's just, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that goes into a lot of hard work behind the scenes, um, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, this doesn't just happen, this is very intentional. And um, our teachers do such a good job of knowing where our students are and how to support them. Okay, and we'll do a quick run through of math if that's okay. I want to show you guys this as well. Um, and again, you're kind of looking at the same type charts, but um, this will be our kindergarten math. So again, you're looking at you know number recognition, basic things like that. Um, and then by school. First grade, and then by school. And again, just looking for that growth um, each time. And primarily in that spring data, that's really what we want to keep our eye on. Look at second grade. That's pretty impressive. And then we'll get by school. That's all second grade. Mm -hmm. so it's Third grade from fall to spring. Fourth grade, fall to spring. And then about the fifth grade. So, yeah, this is awesome. great. A great job, you know, and um just very proud again of our teachers our our not and, and and also just our coaches our literacy coaches our math coach um you know just a lot of people um working together as a team and i think mr kirkland said it really well earlier just you know everybody kind of pulling together to support our students all right and then just a quick breakdown um i actually had our new math coach jessica bryant um we need to i'm not know if you guys are we it just happened kind of in the year we probably need to get her into you guys this year but um we we uh kind of worked on this together and i wanted to kind of just dissect it a little bit for you and so there's a lot of information and of course you can read through it but i thought we could kind of hit on some of the high points of this um so basically the overview is that the state um wanted to create this comprehensive plan much like the literacy act so to speak um, some of some similarities, but then also some differences, like Dr. Neal mentioned earlier, there's not a retention piece to this law, um, like there is the Literacy Act, so that part is definitely different. Um, but essentially what the, the end game is, is to provide a math coach in every elementary school. And this is in a couple, couple of different places in the law, so I kind of put it here, but then also you're going to see it to where they, they quantified it and they said, 
Um, an elementary school with 500 or more students, um, one math coach. So we'll see kind of how that, that part looks. But I think the end game is to have a math coach in every elementary school K-5. Of course, there will be training, um, the curriculum, the fourth grade really is kind of the, the grade that, um, and you'll see this on the next slide, so I'll go ahead and let Dwayne move through this, but um, let's see if I've got it on here. They really are going to be tested on fractions. Fractions will be kind of the, and this, that's not a surprise to me, fractions, I've, goodness, that's just been across the board. You can hear teachers talk about it, just that the struggle that students have, not just not just trustful students, students across the state. That's why I think they've, they've chosen fractions to kind of be the, the test to look at or the content to look at. So we'll have to see um, how that actually shakes out. But essentially, um, you know, the interventions will start at the beginning of next summer, okay, as far as um, what summer learning might look, at, look like. And what they're saying now, it would be schools in the bottom 6% of math proficiency. Um, will participate in the Alabama Mathematics Summer Achievement Program. I don't think that doesn't really pertain to us because that's just not something we have to really look at. But I will say this, we will continue um, because the last couple of summers we have piloted a summer math um, type camp. And so we, we actually have another, uh, we've done two, one week, we did one week a couple of weeks ago, we'll do another week in July. And we'll continue to do that um, just because we still we still do have a small percentage of students that we want to continue to support. So we'll continue that. And then the expectations for teachers, it just talks a little bit about um, the number of minutes spent per day teaching math, um, building the fluency. Again, the test is going to revolve around uh, fractions is what we're kind of, you know, it's what we're being told at this point. So um, I would assume that that would stay, stay true to that. But really, I think things will start to kind of kick off next summer. I know that I know the state really has a mission in front of them as far as um, creating this task force, uh, finding all these teachers that are going to become math coaches. I think that's going to be a, I think that could be a potential challenge. Um, so I just think there are a lot of moving pieces and parts to this, but you know, we're gonna to continue to tackle all the information as we get it and continue to work with our students. Um, but yeah, so that's that's just a, a dissection of the New Mercy Act. And again, the retention piece is not a part of this one. So, and again, this just talks a little bit about the fractions um, as being kind of that, that identified piece that uh, will be the focus. I think that's about it. Yep, okay. All right, any questions on the Well, it's definitely the bias is real observable, concrete evidence we're on task that we are doing what we're supposed to be and probably ahead of most people in the state. What I, I would like to say yes yeah, to that. Currently, <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's built that we've got that expectation. So that's great. Yeah. So congratulations to everybody involved. Well, thank you. It is a team effort. And like I said, our academic coaches, they play such a strong role in that too. Um, with Kelly McGee and Jenny Peters and our new math coach and our previous math coach, Monica Bramlett, I mean, our so the students are teachers. Teachers. And the parents are there yes. just supporting it. Yes, I think so. And I think we've done a really good job of communicating with parents just about everything, um, especially with the Literacy Act and just all the steps and pieces and parts and what are these reading improvement plans. And the parents are very much a part of that process. So they really are in the know all the way through. And I think that's really important. There's nine surprises. Well, none of this is radical to trust. I mean, as far as what's expectation. No. And that's what's interesting. The state has come up with all these mandates. And we, and we are already there or ahead of that, which is wonderful. Yeah, we would try with great sure. people for sure. So, right. thank you all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. Very proud of you. We look forward to all the secret stores. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We can't wait to see the embargo schools. Uh -huh. uh, real high hopes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Poopy is zooming in with us from a conference, and she is our assistant superintendent for student support services. So I'll let Dwayne work his magic and see if we can connect with Dr. Poopy. Dr. Poopy, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Fantastic. 
Um, well, what you're looking at on the stream right now, and, and we'll start with that, is our SIR report. And so last year I brought you um, that we had 61 SIR reports. These are offenses that will take students out of school and out of school suspensions um, or maybe fights or some of our more um, extreme incidents. So in 1920, you see we had 91 um, incidents. In 2021, 61. And this year we had 34. Um, so that was great. The principals did an amazing job of working with students to keep them in the schools when they had an incident um, rather than sending them home so we can ensure they had learning opportunities. Um, and so I just, I can't praise them enough for all the hard work that they put forth to really work with me, work with Beth Hardwell, our mental health advisor, work with Cal Riddle um, to do uh, hearings and find ways that we could creatively support students within their, in, in our schools and keep them in our schools. That being said, it leads us into our discussion of the MAPS program. And um, Dwayne, we won't use that slide again. So uh, our MAPS program, we are going to restart in 2022. And we've been working diligently on finding the best way to do that to provide our students that may need to be out of our schools uh, for a variety of discipline referrals or other things to provide them support. So we will open MAPS in August at the Alternative Learning Center. We'll have a middle school, high school, and elementary um, teachers and opportunities with an administrator. Um, we're working with UAB to provide some additional mental health supports. Beth Hardwell will go down and provide some mental health supports. Um, we're going to have rhythm for all students K through eight next year. So those students will work on that in the morning and tell us how they're feeling. And we'll have a counselor down there to have a class meeting, um, working with Dr. Barry and um, Ms. Chamberlain to find ways to ensure we know what's going on with our students and improve the PACE program. So we want to make sure the PACE is very strong down at MAPS. So we're trying to provide all the opportunities we can uh, to support our students in the MAP program. So you'll be hearing more about that. I'm working on their, um, not code of conduct, but their own handbook. So you'll be hearing more about that and looking at that in the coming months. Um, also with all those things, we are reorganizing and relaunching PACE. So we recently got an anti-bullying, anti-suicide grant for just over $36,000. And we're going to use those resources to provide rhythm, which you approved earlier in the year. It is a software program where our students go in and note, are they feeling tired today? Have they had a good day? Are they happy? Do they have needs? And the teachers, principals, counselors can all look and see how our students are feeling and if we need to make some personal contacts to support them. Um, so now with that, we're also going to require some class meetings every day in every classroom to help support those needs and create conversations. What we've discovered is that if we can remind students how to start back and recreate relationships and how to communicate with each other and how to share appropriately coming back into the school and becoming the new normal, we think we can make things better. So working with PACE to recreate that is going to be great. Um, that being said, you'll soon be getting a survey that we're working on that will take the 25 character education words that the state requires and ask students and our, uh, all of our stakeholders in our school community to list or vote on, take those 10 top words that we need to make sure we focus on every day um, across the months to support character education and how we're gonna work on that in our schools. So we wanna make sure we choose the right words as our concept words. We're gonna make sure all of our terms are identified, um, defined, and our students know how to use them. And we're gonna try and really rebuild our character education and relaunch PACE so it's successful for Trustful City Schools. And that you know when students come out of our system, they know how to be the best citizen and have social skills and communication skills to work with others. So we're very excited about that. Um, you've also, um, as you've toured the building, you've seen the Family Resource Center. So we're building some comprehensive items with that. We have uh, working again with UAB to not only support our teachers through our mental health um, EAP there, but also provide some counseling services um, to our families when they need them. So that will be an opt-in opportunity for parents and students if they need that support um, to work with UAB, work with their counselors on grief, um, addiction, whatever that support they need 
is people just go back out into the community. They're finding that they need help learning to communicate with each other as parents and learning to communicate within the school. So really thank you. The Family Resource Center is getting some robust opportunities. Um, we're sitting here with April Chamberlain. We have looked at a variety, a variety of tools to be able to share what's in the Family Resource Center and share things out to our families that may not come into the center, but may need some support. So there's a lot going on in student services. It is exciting. It is encouraging um, that we're getting back to normal and we're putting resources in to support our students and their families every day in ways that are positive so that we can just begin again and make sure that things are really successful for families going back into the world of what is the new normal. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or anything I can help you with? Thank you. We're good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoy your conference. Absolutely. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Walker, do you have some system stats for us in athletics? Mm -hmm. Got things on everything. Trusted assistants getting us set up. Um, Wayne, you can go ahead on to the next slide. So, just wanted to start uh, kind of a recap of our year with some um, interesting numbers. Uh, this year, all of our teams, if you look at our middle school and high school together, uh, we combined to participate in 1,044 games slash events. Um, so, it's a lot. We did hear from our uh, friends at GoFam who do all the ticketing. It was some of the fourth most tickets of any school in the state last year. Uh, so, that um, you know, it's a big thank you to everyone that supports us. Uh, total, we had 65 teams compete this year. So, you know, we have 23 varsity championship programs, but when you throw in JV teams, ninth grade teams, middle school teams, uh, in total, we had 65 teams out there competing uh, for the school year. Uh, during the year, we have three different signing ceremonies, uh, one in November, one in February, and then another one in April. So in total, we have 27 of our senior student athletes signed college scholarships this year. So we're excited about that. Um, you know, one thing that I think is impressive about this note is eight different sports were represented. So I think that just shows, um, you know, the job that everyone with our coaching staff and our administrators are doing. And, um, you know, creating those opportunities for so many uh, students and so many students. And this year, uh, we went over a thousand students uh, participating in athletics. So, seventh grade through twelfth grade, we had one thousand and fifteen uh, students compete in our athletic program this year. So, uh, we're excited about the increased numbers and uh, the availability of these programs to get our students involved. This is uh, the twenty-four sports that we had this year. Uh, at the varsity level, uh, this is a little chart. So, uh, Dwayne, you can hit on hit on our link right there. So this year, um, of course, the first year of girls flag football, um, our team won the state championship. Uh, we had three other teams that earned state runner-up finishes, girls indoor track, baseball, and softball. Then we had six other teams that finished within the top four of their sport. So if you think about 32 teams being in 7A, we had 10 of our 24 programs, almost half, come in the top four, which I think is really good. Then if you throw in uh, the top eight, which would be the top 25% of 7A, that would increase our number to 14. So 14 out of 24 uh, finished in the top 25% of seven days. So just an interesting way to look at it. Of course, you know, as I met with our coaches at the end of the season, you know, what our goal is, is for everybody to move a column. You know, if we're coming in second to support, what things can we do to support you to get in that left-hand column? If we're over here just missing the playoffs, what can we do to get to the playoffs? You know, all of our programs are in uh, different positions and different steps. Um, which is fine and understandable. So uh, we're just working together to try to support them and help them uh, take that next step and move one column to the left. You know, an interesting one that I like to mention with the steps is our volleyball team. You know, three years ago, our record at the end of the year, we were three and 31. The next year, we won 13 games for the season. 
This year we went 19 and 18. It's the first time we've had a winning record since, like I can, you know, find stats for. So again, I think that's just an example of everything we've done with the youth program, what we've done with the middle school program, and it's taken steps. You know, we're eventually want to compete for championships, but you know, that doesn't happen overnight. But you know, I think it's an example of uh, trying to move the cotton. All right, well, let's move on to the next one here. Uh, this is a kind of a, a spreadsheet that I came up with. You can hit it here. So we wanted to try to track all the sports, how we uh, finished in 7A. So the 32 teams in 7A, what I did with this, these are obviously all of our sports in the columns here. So if a team uh, won the state championship, they were the one. If they came in second, they were the two. If you were the two teams that lost in the semifinal, you were both the three. If you missed a playoff, if you missed the playoffs, you were a 17. Okay, so we tracked it all year, every sport, one to 32, you know, through every sport, and then at the end added them all up. So this is kind of like at the end of the day, this is sort of like golf. You know, a low score is good. You want a low score. So you want to scroll all the way to the right there. There you go. So this would this would be our total right here, 187 points, if we want to call them points. Um, so, you know, this is two years in a row we've done it this way and we finished fifth uh, two years in a row. So, again, I think it just shows um, how many of our programs are competing, uh, you know, towards the top of 7A. Uh, but again, this is kind of a challenge for all of us uh, because, you know, you know, if the question is, how do we get up to the top? Well, then we got to go back to the slide I showed you before. How do we get every team to move over, you know, a column to the left? How do we get our twos to become ones, our 17s to become nines, and so on? You think the high school association would be interested in this? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, or maybe, uh, you know, one of the newspaper well, outlets. This is or, you know, they, uh, I'll buy a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to look at um, as you go down the line because you know what I what I brainstorm about at night is you know how do we not have any seventeens? Is you know how do we kind of move, move everybody over? So this is just an interesting way to look at it. So we spent kind of all year every time a sport ended, we inputted the numbers for that sport. Then at the end of the year, we added them all up and sorted them by the total. Uh, so kind of interesting to look at. How, how we went with that. So we're we're very encouraged, and but we're not uh, satisfied. We have I don't think anybody uh, with us has you know feels like we've arrived by any means. We have a lot of work to do, um, but it's a good way to kind of see where we stand. I think. All right, and then let's move on to the next one here. Okay, this is uh for for all of our history people here. This is a picture of our first ever state championship team. This is the 1975 girls bowling team, first state championship team in school history. So we have now won in the history of our school, we've won 18 state titles. So that was the first one. Um, interesting note, six of those 18 state titles have been since 2016. Our baseball team won in 2016. So a third of our state titles have come in the last six years. All right. So then when we look at uh, going to the next one there, when we look at our uh, state runner-up finishes in the history of our school, again, dating back forever, uh, we, we've been the state runner-up 20 times in school history. Uh, our first state runner-up was in 1984. That was the wrestling team. Uh, this is, of course, our baseball team that just uh, came in second. So we've been the state runner-up or the winner of the red map nine times since 2016. So if you look at that, those two things together, state championships, state runner-up finishes, blue trophies, red trophies, we've got a total of 38 of those, the history of our schools. 15 of those um, we've earned since 2016. So uh, again, we're almost half. So I think again, one you can hit on that link there. Uh, this is something that uh, we've done some research on through the State Association site. So this will show you uh, the first column there, there's all of our state championship teams from most recent uh, back. And then the uh, red column, those are our state runner-up finishes uh, from current back. Um, so I think, again, just shows uh, the momentum that we have, um, how many programs that we have that are competing at that level. Uh, but it's also a challenge for us to uh, continue moving forward. Uh, and I think it, 
you know, ties into what we talked about earlier today from a facility standpoint, uh, making sure that uh, we're thinking about all of our students, all of our programs, and giving them everything that they need to uh, just be at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's a few notes about uh, classification. You know, the state association uh, does classification every two years, so we're about to enter a new cycle this fall. So this will be for the 22-23 and 23-24 school years. So we will be in the same region, uh, the same 18 region. The only change in our football region is we lose the Addison City, who has gone 6A, and we gain Chelsea, who has come, in, who has come 7A. Uh, in our, we are also going to stay in 7A area 6, so this is in sports or in a four-team area like basketball, soccer, baseball, softball. Um, our four-team area is now us, Spain Park, Oak Mountain, and Chelsea. So there's been uh, a little bit of shifting and change with that. So that's who you will see the most of the next two years. Uh, we are now 22nd out of 32 teams at 7A in terms of enrollment, which uh, Two classification cycles ago, we were 29th. So I think this shows the growth, the growth of our school system and city uh, to go from 29th to 22nd in four years. Uh, now, here's a crazy uh, stat that's true, but hard to believe. Uh, okay, so we're, we're a 7A program. Auburn is now the largest school in the state, largest 7A school. So the way they do classification, it's on three grade levels, grades nine through 11. So Auburn has 922 more students than us for those three grade levels, okay? So let's say that's roughly 300 a grade level. That's 150 boys and 150 girls per grade level. It's a lot. Okay, so I pulled uh, Satsuma High School, which is a 4A school. The difference between us and Satsuma is 812. So it is a true statement to say the difference between us and Auburn, who's in the same classification as us, that is a larger difference than us in a forest. I remember this quote when you said it about three or four years ago that we were closer in numbers to a 1A, there was a, was it 1A school? <laughs> you know, or to the largest 7A school. And I remember that. It was like, that's a big deal. Yeah. It's so, in this classification stuff. Right, absolutely. So, um, you know, we don't use this as an excuse. Like, it's the truth. It is what it is. Um, but, you know, we've shown that we can compete with these other people. Um, you know, <coughs> I think our margin of error is just smaller, you know, which all the small things with coaching and getting the right people and retaining the coaches that we need, facilities, practice, everything that we do is just uh, heightened because we have to do things to make up that difference somehow. Uh, here's a few notes about uh, things coming up for those we're working on right now. Uh, we're doing all the eligibility this summer, so a lot of time in Dragonfly with uh, approving documents, eligibility, building rosters for the fall teams. Uh, it's taken up a lot of our summer. Uh, scheduling is going well. We've finished all of our fall schedules. A lot of our winter sports have finished up. Um, things were going out there in July with, with the tickets, um, you know, all of our digital things with that. Uh, tonight um, on your agenda is an agreement with an event staff. Um, you know, last year we had an event staff uh, for the first time. So uh, tonight's group, um, we've heard really good things about. They've worked with two other 7 8 programs in the Birmingham area uh, doing their events, meaning uh, ticket sales, ticket validators, gate, gate workers. Different from last year. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so that is a uh, no cost to the board. That's always been something that each individual sport pays for um, from their gate uh, intake there. So, is there anything on the way on GoFan to avoid the, the whatever they want administrative fee? Okay, has there been any discussion with GoFan about that? Yeah, for most schools in the state, it's higher than what ours is. Our, ours is a dollar, and you know they came to our region several years back and said, "Hey, you agree to kind of do all your sports through us, not use another one. We will bump that down to one dollar instead of higher than that. I think it was around a dollar and thirty cents. So, um, you know, I think the only way to get around 
not having the consumer pay it, it's us pay it. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is like when I go and ask if I go to a game mm -hmm. and I'm buying multiple tickets, I'm paying that fee multiple times. Right. And that just seems really unfair. Right. Yeah, it's up to the home school how they right. set that up. Um, now, what we've done, which I think helps that a little bit, you know, we set up a pass. You only pay it one time. So right. with all of our sports, we've set up a, you know, a football season pass or whatever it is that we can get to our parents. They can go and pay for it one time. They get a ticket for all the games and then they only pay it once. <laughs> kind of the same with our student pass. Um, you know, we've always priced that. It's been $25. So there's a fee onto that, but then every time they come, they're not paying that additional fee every time they buy a ticket. I think it's just no way. That's no doubt. I think about it. It's other people's babies and new puppies. <laughs> <laughs> I can get you some. Are <laughs> <laughs> we keeping the ability to use paper credit card? I was saying, you can use Correct. Yes, you can. You can pay by credit card. Um, they they offer that service. You know, they've given us iPads and card readers, so it is through them. But you don't have to go through an app or anything like that. You can show up with credit card. You're still paying your dollars. Oh, yeah. It was just slow, though. But I mean, at times, so then it got faster. And, started to and then it was slower where you put. Sure. So we're still up where we stood in the past. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So they, buy, they go to any sporting event. Yeah, any regular season game. And that's been, um, that's definitely right. Yeah, parents. wildly successful. I mean, we've had every year thousands of students do that. Um, so I think it's been. Uh, that's been a way for people to save money. You know, not not many schools do that. So other schools, when they're taking their elementary students in hand, they're paying the same fee that they don't pay. So I think that's been something nice we've been able to do. Uh, to just, I mean, the whole the whole idea behind it is to encourage people to come to come right. for the world and experience that, and see kids playing where they want to be one day, and all those things. I think that's great. Best thing ever. It's good. The only, the only thing I will say is that, like, my child's uh, nine year old, his is on my phone. And so, like, if my husband takes him to the game, it's a pain to get his student pass everything. Right. Yeah, we, you know, we heard that last year. They told us uh, in our meetings this summer that there's now a transfer fee okay. or a transfer way, just like if you bought a ticket, you could transfer it to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, they told us that we can now do that with the pass. So, Hopefully that will be a place. You can see what the fee is for that. <laughs> <laughs> there should be a fee for that. Yeah, because I get what you're saying. Because last year we would have people like share their username and passwords so they get in somebody else's account. So, yeah, we brought that up in the end and hopefully that, that is fixed now. Good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move right into the principal's reports. And Ms. Abney is first. <laughs> Hurry up. Let me bring the hardware up here. Yes. That would just. Yes. Um, I'll just jump right in. Um, just kind of a recap of this past school year. Um, it was awesome. It was so great to come off the hills of COVID and be a part of this A plus college ready grant that we received. And today um, at our administrator training, as Dr. Barry mentioned earlier, we were recognized as a school of excellence um, because we exceeded our um, 50 point growth overall for all of our students. So yeah, it was, it was really exciting, really exciting. Yeah, this grant, I appreciate Dr. Barry bringing it to us. Actually, we applied for it, was it the year before that? I guess during COVID and, it just didn't happen. And we were persistent and applied again and received this grant. And, you know, we had lots of conversations with our teachers about it and um, just kind of what this would look like. Um, it was, it was, this is what we were going to do. If you're here at HTMS as a teacher, this is what you're going to do. And the training, um, the implementation it was a non negotiable. And we had some that really just dove right in. And I think it was, the perfect timing. I, I talked with an A plus um, 
director uh, last week when they were doing the training at the high school and she said i know the timing wasn't good for you all to do that and i told her i said i 100 disagree i thought the timing was perfect we needed this coming off the hills of COVID. we needed to have a laser focus on academics let's get back to to what we know we're all about and so i thought i just i couldn't be more proud of our teachers of our students um, I, I thought the timing was just perfect. So, um, you know, our teachers have put forth so much work with us. They've gone to, um, you know, training last summer, four days of training. They're all going to training this summer. Um, there's a year one and a year two, so it's two different locations. Um, they've gone to training throughout the school year. We just implemented some things and it, it's really cool because my time at the middle school, it, it's been part of COVID all three years that I've been there. And so it was really cool to see on the tail end of this, you know, I know getting back to some of the things that Dr. Barry got going before I left, you know, with just that focus on um, high standards and the rigor. And so I'm just really proud of, of all the things that have come from that, from doing the grant. Look forward to continuing that. Um, I want to say thank you for allowing us to have the interventions. They were huge. Um, and us being able to close some of the gaps and support some of our students who were um, really during that time of during COVID and there were just some gaps and, and we knew that. And so the interventionists were, were a huge help of helping us close some of those gaps. And we saw it. It was so exciting to see some of these kids. They can log into their portals um, with, um, with College Board and they can see their growth. And these kids who you know, they, they may not have been super excited about data or their own scores, and they just got fired up. I grew by 70 points. You know, I grew in math. I grew in, in, in um, my reading, and I just think a lot of that is, you know, due to, in part, to our teachers, but also our interventionists. We were able to provide that targeted support for them. So it was good stuff. Um, it, this year just felt like normal, a little more normal. We were able to, just thinking about our fine arts, we were able to have band concerts in person. I don't know if y'all came to see High School Musical Junior, but my goodness, it was awesome. Jennifer Bruno and, and the work that she did with our with our theater, our choir, their performances, and um, you know their accolades that they have received. Our art program, they were able to take um, field trip to the art museum this year, and we haven't been able to do that in a while. So just all those things that we're able to get back on the right, uh, I feel like on, on the right track. We had athletic successes throughout the whole year. We won Metro um, in wrestling and push track and just, just saw successes throughout all of our programs. We were able to do spring fling this year. I, it was the, you ask any teacher in our building, they will tell you spring fling was their most fun day the entire year. <laughs> well, I think we had just as much fun as the kids did. And just to be able to see them interact with each other and just kind of a celebration of a great school year was, was really um, awesome. Uh, we had some teachers retire. We had some resign, and um, you know we're we're excited to with some of our new hires for next year. Our growth throughout the year. We started out the school year with one thousand one hundred and seventeen students, and ended with one thousand one hundred forty-seven students. We'll start out this year one thousand one hundred sixty students. So anyway, they keep coming, they keep taking them. <laughs> so. Um, that's exciting, but we're just we're just really grateful for the hard work of our teachers and our students throughout the school year. Um, our goals for this coming up year, our continued focus on the rigor and relevance, um, and um, really just going right into the second year of this grant. Uh, we just left two days of administrator training. We had teachers last week at training at the high school. We'll have our first year teachers that will go to Decatur um, in July for their training, just to keep keep that trajectory going and that upward direction um, is, is our hope with that. Also, we want to make sure that social emotional well-being of our students is continuing to be addressed. Um, it's something that I think this past school year we were able to see that um, our, some of our kids had a hard time coming out of COVID and some of that isolation, all the screen time. And so um, we just want to make sure that we're making those genuine connections with them. I'm excited about the rhythm program that Dr. Pippi mentioned, um, us doing morning meetings with our kids and just making sure that we're plugging in and we're addressing all those needs of our kids, not just the academic needs, but those social emotional needs as well. I think it's huge. Um, we're excited to have um, a health counselor unit this coming up year. That's going to be um, a great addition to our staff. Um, 
and continue with our 5D roster activity. That's always an eye-opening um, experience for us to see, you know, who has connections with our kids in our building. So also school safety, obviously. I just came from um, TASRA conference in, in Orange Beach, and it was, it was really heavy. It was really heavy. And um, I'm just grateful that our district and our city put so much emphasis on school safety. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was very emotional this morning when he was to the school. It was pretty emotional. It was, it, this was a different conference of all many years, and this one just had a different, it just had a different air to it. I, I don't know. It was, it was, it was pretty heavy, but one of the things I'm proud of is Dr. Bernie James. He's a leading expert on school law. Um, he's at Pepperdine University, and I've heard him speak multiple times, and he actually recognized Trustful as kind of the, the model school system for school safety based on the number of SROs that we have and just all the things that we Put in place, you know, to keep our to keep our students safe. So I'm just grateful that you know for the relationship we have with them. Sergeant Fletcher's office is right next door to mine, and we're always brainstorming about what what can we do better, what what are what are we missing, what are we keeping our you know, just making sure we're focused on that at all times. And so I, I I'm I'm proud of the work that we do, and we just have to continue. It has to be at our focus every day, every day. Okay, let's talk about enrollment for next year. I'm excited about the sixth grade babies coming up, especially after seeing the data that I was just seeing about the AIMS web. That's exciting. It's really exciting. Um, we have 382 sixth graders coming to us this year. Um, we'll have 365 seventh graders in our big class of eighth graders, 413. So our total enrollment to start off so far is at 1,160. So. Um, we're super excited. We've got 100 faculty and staff, 71 certificated, 29 non certificated. Um, one thing that we are doing different this year, and this is just from a lot of input from teachers, is we're tweaking our bell schedule a bit. Um, this is eight periods, but the school day is exactly the same. Um, this past year and years past, we've had our lunch periods embedded into academic classes. So imagine you're teaching math, you're trying to engage seventh graders who may have come from PE and regroup them and teach math. You teach for seven minutes, then you gotta go to lunch. Then you gotta come back and then you gotta refocus them and get back, get back on track. Um, we just feel like there was a better way to do it. So we have we had that uh, block of time that was our HT homeroom. So it was like, okay, we just need to stick those two together, the lunch and the homeroom. And so each grade level will have a lunch and homeroom period. And so during that, I say homeroom, it's really an enrichment time or an intervention time. We're going to be able to use our interventionists very strategically during those specific grade level times to make sure our kiddos are getting the support that they need. And instructional time is not being interrupted by lunch. Um, you know, there's a lot of kiddos to try to get through that lunchroom. And um, we start early. We call it sixth grade, you know. Little brunch time, you know. Um, so we, we've got to make sure that we're being efficient with our time. And actually, our lunch times really haven't changed a whole lot of the times that they're going. We just did some reconfiguring, I guess you could say. So we're excited. Our teachers were really excited about this because I think they're having to, you know, get them regrouped after lunch can be a challenge. So um, something we're doing next year. We're excited about that. Uh, we're in the process of making plans for our sixth grade orientation, bring our kids in, let them learn how to do lockers, and then we'll do a meet the teacher um, once school gets rolling. So just excited to have hopefully some more normalcy this school year and just continue our trajectory of, um, of excellence and success. Um, do you have any questions? No. Just, just want to thank y'all for everything. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Hey, thanks. Congratulations. Super excited. I'm pretty sure my seventh grade and eighth graders class is the one with the model of, of the math after distraction. I think they went, I think they were there for about eight minutes. They, they were. They, they were. They were. Um, and it's hard to get those, those, those precious. Well, I think there were a lot of boys in that. I know exactly what class you're talking about. Yeah, with a lot of child's class. Well, well, and London is a big priority for my kids. Well, welcome, Dr. Lotz. Hello. Hello. You guys have.
Okay, um, I just wanted to start out by talking. We had a really unusual year of home last year um, with our growth. And so I want to talk about that before I talk about projected enrollment. Um, I'm really proud of what our teachers have done because we gained 149 new students last year, which, which is, I think, a record number um, since I've been there anyway. And that's in grades one through five. We didn't even count kindergarten. We didn't track the new ones coming in throughout the year in kindergarten in this number. So that's grades one through five. And I just wanted to point out, um, you know, it, it, we had some aha moments when we got these new students and they were kind of scattered throughout the year. Um, they came from schools that closed down during COVID or went virtual or so they were not, we had some learning gaps to address, but we had more significant gaps to address with our new students. So um, if you look at this first pie chart, these are our new students that came in last year, grades one through five, and you can see 47 of them were at risk in reading, and at risk is the orange and the yellow. The orange is below the 10th percentile nationally, and the yellow is below the 24th percentile. So that was a third of the new students who were truly at risk for reading when they walked through our doors. Um, if you look below that graph with math, um, 37 students or 25% were at risk in math. There's some overlap there, and then there's some that were low in reading, not low in math. So, um, but it was really important to note, you know, I just wanted to point out first grade. So I'm highlighting first grade. First grade is such a crucial year for learning to read. And out of those 149 students, 51 were in first grade which was kind of crazy. So, um, and in, when you look back at the makeup of those students, you know, some didn't go to kindergarten because of COVID, some went to, or did a virtual kindergarten, but 49% of the new students in first grade were at risk of reading. So we had a lot of work to do from the get-go with our new students. And then if you look down at math for these first graders, 35% were at risk in math. So from the very beginning of the year, my first grade teachers were saying, man, we just, we got a lot of work to, you know, they were, they could feel it. They knew what was going on. I had to see the data to really understand what they were talking about. And so we worked really hard this year. They worked super hard and um, made a huge difference. I did want to also mention that um, out of the 149 students, you know how you have students come and go during the year, people transfer. So the net increase was 99 students, which is an 8.1% increase in our enrollment last year. And we were still enrolling students the last couple of weeks of school, believe it or not. I couldn't believe it, but oh yeah, two weeks left of school, we're enrolling a new student. So it was, but there was like a steady flow throughout the year and our teachers handled that really, really well. So I'm really proud of them. I want to go into the projected enrollment. So with the upcoming students without the anticipated growth, um, we will be at 1,313 students. Um, then, if you look, if we have a repeat of that 8.1% growth this year, we're projecting by the end of the year, we could be a little over 1,400. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, I'll move over to the right for just a minute. Um, we are sending 233 students to the middle school. So, that was a pretty large class. Yeah. And... Um, so that's factored in as well. I did want to give you the teacher and staffing update. We have one teacher retire after 30 plus years. Um, we had um, four teachers, and actually I, I just got a new one. We had five teacher resignations, but two were relocations. One was getting married and moving out of state. Once uh, her husband transferred, these were all, there was only one that, that maybe is controllable or avoidable. Two others were to be close to daycares where their children are. They were having a difficult time getting across town. 
And so um, we also have replaced, uh, we have filled our assistant principal position. We're really excited about that. And we have filled our library media position. So we've got great staff coming on board. We're real excited and um, about how we move forward. Our school indicator for next year, we're going to get back down to some basics because again, these new students coming in from all these different places, we, we've got to get back to well-managed classroom. We've got to make sure we're maximizing every minute of our learning time. And so we the uh, morning meetings and all the different things we're going to do and some training that curriculum instruction is going to provide as well, um, we're going to get very focused in on that and really maximizing that learning time. The other thing, so that will be our indicator for this year, but the other thing we're focused on uh, with a long-term focus, and I think this will take probably about three years, is this collective teacher efficacy, which is really, really important. Um, and what that is, it's just a, it's almost like a cultural shift. It's where teachers truly know that their collective efforts make a difference. There's a synergy and that we're all work. It's not my kids, your kids. We're all working toward the same goals together. It's, it's our students. And so um, I've been really reading and studying a lot about this. And I first learned about this through some training that Dr. Berry offered. And it's one of John, Dr. John Hattie's high impact strategies. So the reason it's really important that we focus on this one is the effect size from all these studies. If he's been studying these for over 15 years, this one's at the top. Um, if you look at the effect sizes, um, 0 0.4 is kind of the hinge point where if the strategy, if you have an effect size of 0 0.4, it means you, it's, it's worth focusing on. It means a year's worth of growth if you focus on that and enhance it. But this particular strategy has an effect size of 1.57. It's like triple that. It is the highest one on the list. So if you can accomplish this, you're going to see incredible results. And so, um, again, it's, it's complicated. It's a very complex strategy. And so um, we're looking at putting the conditions in place to be able to evolve with this um, collective efficacy. So some of those conditions we're focusing on are teacher empowerment, they're over on the right, true goal consensus. And um, I participated in a, web, in a, a day long <laughs> webinar this yesterday from the author of one of the books, and it was amazing. But um, really focusing on not just performance goals, like our data, but mastery goals, like a different type of goal. And so we're going to spend a lot of time working on goal setting. Um, peer observations, really start ramping that up again now that we're out of the pandemic and learning from each other about what works and what doesn't work. Um, this cohesive staff, I'm, what I'm really talking about there is really reflecting on student learning as a group rather than in isolation. So taking our collaboration to the next level. And then um, we're doing great with our intervention systems. We still got a, we've got a little work to do with math, but our reading interventions are working really well. And so those have to be in place as well. So we're really going to focus in on enhancing some of these things to set up the conditions for this collective efficacy to start to really occur. Um, the other thing on this front page I wanted to bring up an initiative for this year is our stream studio. I'm really excited about this. Um, we're setting up a room, it's our stream studio, and it, it's where teachers can take their students for STEM activities. We did change it to stream because we want reading in there and we want the arts in there. But um, we're working on a catalog of rigorous STEM activities and the students will learn the engineering design process and they'll follow that to complete these activities. So it's going to be a key part of our enrichment process. And then finally, um, if you'll flip over on the back side, um, just wanted to share our year in data. I know Dr. Berry already shared some of this data, but um, just a couple of things to point out. Um, if you look at our reading data, the red are our students that were high risk, and the yellow is moderate risk, and the green, no risk. 
So we started out in the fall with 16% of our students high risk for reading down to 9% in the spring. Um, moderate risk started out at 14%. This is overall, all grade levels, down to 7%. And we increased the students with zero risk from 70% to 84%. And then if you look at the math down below, um, we started out with 14% high risk down to 7%, 16% uh, moderate risk down to 5%. And we increased uh, the no risk students from 69% to 88%. Really proud of what our teachers have done here. And then, and then finally, um, these graphs, these line graphs, the reason I wanted you to see these and the details are not important, it's just getting the visual of it. Um, if you look at the, um, the bar, the solid line, that's pain. If you look at the dotted line, that's the uh, national average. And the three points are fall, winter, and spring. And what I see happening here, which is pretty amazing, is with kindergarten, we start out very close to the national average. Everybody's kind of in the same boat. But look what happens once you get to fifth grade through our system. The gap between us and the rest of the world widens which is really a testimony to the learning experiences at Trustful City Schools, not just Payne, but all of Trustful City Schools. Um, so I'm really proud of that. And I'm proud of, I'm, I'm gonna take you back to first grade for just a minute, because it's really important. If you look at first grade reading, the line graph, the national average because of our data at the beginning of the year for the first time ever was higher than Payne. But look what happened by the end of the year, we crossed and exceeded the national average. So I'm really proud of those teachers. And then in math, if you'll look, we were right at the same level with the national average in math, but by end of the year, they exceeded. There, there's a larger gap now. So really proud of what they were able to accomplish here. Um, and of course, we're focusing on safety and all these other things as well. Other things as well. We're continuing with our epic moments to keep our students challenged and uh, engaged. And we're looking forward to a great year. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Your house is nice for my belly. <laughs> Well, let's talk, Magnolia. Hey, hey. you can work us out. Yes, I have. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. <laughs> you were on the side for a while. <laughs> I was holding up this side. <laughs> well, it. I will reiterate just uh, what Lisa and Jeff are saying. You know, we had a great ending to the school year. Um, it did feel more like normal. And so we had parents within the building and kids were um, just, again, getting back to what is, uh, or what we would consider to be normal. Summer has started and our building is looking great. Uh, our custodians, Joy and Sherry, handle our building. So they wax our floors. So we don't have a company come in and so, they do a really good job. They're very kicky because they know I'm kicky. And so therefore, we are going to have some fabulous floors. And so the building is getting back to um, where it's going to be clean. And so it's looking great. And then I've had the opportunity because we basically closed down Magnolia for a brief period of time to tell teachers because Joy needs that space because she may be waxing on the front hall this morning and in the afternoon she's waxing on the back hall. So we don't need, you know, kids coming in or uh, teachers coming in. And so therefore we give them that time. That allows me to work on all of the rosters and, and everything. And I'm proud to say that I'm, I'm ready to roll. We are uh, ready to go with, uh, you know, with school for the opening uh, 
of this next school year. We ended the bill, and I know you had the handout as well, but we ended the school year with 357 students uh, at Magnolia. We're looking at um, right now approximately 351 to begin the school year. We've had uh, a few that have moved to Payne uh, because of uh, purchasing homes in, in some of the other uh, areas. So therefore, I'm giving Lisa three of my uh, the children that are near and dear to my heart. And I know you will, but it's still not the same. <laughs> but I love them, and I know that they're going to do great. And I know that they are in very good hands. Um, so that's you know about looking at about 20 kids you know, per, we have three classroom teachers per grade level, K through five. So, you know, that's, that's what we're looking at there. Um, the snapshot is below the picture where you can see we have, with staffing, we have 59, and that's including our people that we share within our uh, district. We have our, you know, EL teacher. We have a large number of EL students at Magnolia. And so Ms. Kilmeyer does spend uh, a little bit more time at Magnolia than she does with the other schools. So we're thankful for her. We're thankful for our two academic coaches. We're thankful for Christine and our technology department that comes in and as the other ladies have, have talked about the interventionist, you know, they have made a huge deal. So we are looking at having 59 and again our wonderful um, bus drivers as well so there's the breakdown of that Ex very pleased that we have hired a music teacher uh, chris byers retired and so therefore we were able to hire danny moore and i guess it's okay to say that okay and so this this afternoon when brandon and mr guzman came to talk about the band uh, and the new hire at the um, high school, middle school. Well, Danny is the husband to this young lady that is being hired. So, and I hired him first, just so you know. So, <laughs> uh, but so we were, and Danny was also the, um, he did his student teaching at Magnolia. So, they're, so they are from here. So they are from here. He is, she's not. Okay. So they are coming to us from I forget where. Colorado. Yes, yeah, so that's it, from Colorado. And so he moved down there and now they they came home and they re, they've married and now uh, so I'm excited. I'm excited to have been here right. knowing that he had done his student teaching. He actually came out in May and he spent a couple of days with Mr. Byers and with the kids. And I was really appreciative of that fact because the kids got to know about him and got used to him. So now they know he was actually here when we had some of our uh, end of the year award ceremonies. And so we were able to introduce him to the parents. So it's not like he's new to us now. He's just one of us. And then we, I am a uh, special education teacher, Ashlyn Way. She is coming to us fresh from Sanford. So I'm very proud to have a Sanford grad um, being one myself. But the reason we are having to uh, have her here is because one of uh, Nicole McClellan, who was our teacher, her husband was relocated. So, you know, she was not one of those that was wanting to go. She wanted to stay. And then tonight you are hopefully going to uh, approve the uh, special ed para that because of a re retirement and then the instructional para uh, also because of a move. Um, and that's all of our new hires, you know, so we had very little uh, hiring to do and I was very grateful of that fact. Um, we've had lots of professional development taking place over the summer. We have lots of teachers that are in our letters training, which is our science of, of reading. We've got uh, lots of grade level collaboration taking place. It's, collaboration with science, math, and then uh, our Amplify, which is our ELA curriculum. Uh, we have technology courses going on. We've got Link Springs. Uh, our center is modules that our special education teachers um, conduct 
uh, that was given to us from Dr. Poopy and then, of course, Dr. Geary with the lunch plans. We were proud of those. Um, collaboration will continue this year with teachers and myself. I will, we meet weekly and we uh, have check ins just to make sure everything's going okay. And we always talk about students. We talk about the data and we talk about where they are, what is needed. So we're going to continue with our peer classroom walkthroughs as well and have that as a bigger focus uh, because we can. This, you know, with everything that is going back to normal, we want that to go back to normal as well. Our communications will continue. Uh, we have the main memo. It's really not a memo, it's like a novel, to be honest with you. There's so much information that is in there, and I know it's kind of a little bit like overload. I talk um, about kind of cutting it down. I thought, well, no, we're not going to cut it down, you know, because parents love it, they love to see what's all happening. And you can't read it all now, just save it for later. So, uh, but it is called the Magnolia Memo. Uh, our teachers send out weekly newsletters, they'll continue those. We have our website, we have an Instagram and a Facebook page uh, that we try to keep, keep up to date. And then I, I send out weekly newsletters myself in regards to the instructional support. Uh, when time, what I need, that is our intervention time, is protected time that's in the morning. And it's a uh, very, uh, we, we strategize in how we take care of our kids and what they need because we want to provide them with that. So we have that, we have our tier two, and then of course our tier three with our interventionist. Um, very proud of what those interventionists are bringing to the table because it's made a big time difference. Then with our social emotional, we've done more meetings for years and that's not going to change. We'll continue with those. Uh, the, our pace skills, our five deep activity and our rhythm app. That was really good last year. Um, that's the first thing the kids would do when they go in and they get their Chromebooks out and then they kind of give us an idea of where they are. I looked at it, uh, Lauren Blake, our counselor looked at that and so did Ms. Blaine. So we had three sets of eyes on it in case somebody was giving us a red flag right off the bat, we were able to, to handle that. And then just on the back, just so you can see some more pictures, you know, we are getting our STEM certification this coming school year. So we want to uh, make sure that we are uh, providing those uh, opportunities for our kids. And if you see one of those pictures, it says STEM kit number 26. We received that Burlington grant, you know, for $5,000. And so we, Rebecca Bishop, our, our wonderful librarian, created all of these STEM kits. So we have a lot, 100 STEM kits that are in the library. And the kids get to check them out at night. So in the afternoon, they bring them back. And, you know, and they're not missing any pieces and they love it. And so we're, we're really proud of that. Another thing I'm really proud of is something new is our leveled lending library. You can see that in the center there. This is for teachers. I found lots of books just in covers and in closets. And because, you know, we just didn't use them. Well, we pulled them all together and now we have a space where teachers can go and they can actually go in if they are looking for a certain book they can go to the lending library and they can borrow we've got class sets and so i'm, I'm really excited about this but this is strictly for teachers this is uh and the teachers we also have math in, at the bottom of the cubbies uh those are different um items, manipulatives, things of that nature that are extra that we can use as well and they can check those out. And then of course our kids, you know, they're at the heart of what we do. And so we're going to have a continue with our yearbook team, our leadership team, our math team, our science Olympiad, our safe control. And so we're going to keep doing what we're doing and keep focusing on what, what we need to focus on and that's our students. And so we expect a great year. That's Magnolia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. The signers met the next week of all the welcome. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, scheduling staff goals. 
and um, I'll be pretty quick and dive into questions. Maybe I should wait a little bit of time to say So, um, our biggest um, scheduling difference this year is um, our third grade teachers are not going to swap classes. So, they are going to keep their students like they do in second grade and first grade and kindergarten. Um, this was something that the teachers wanted to do. And uh, their reasoning was for um, in more and better integration of the curriculum and also relationship capacity. But a big factor is the Alabama Literacy Act and the amount of documentation and things that a reading teacher um, you know, creates for these students. They thought it would be easier to manage that if they were teaching, you know, just a group of 22 instead of 44. So um, we're really excited about that. And I actually met with them today and they've already mapped out the entire year. Don't let me tire. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, our weekly schedules are, are staying the same. Our teachers um, have back to back planning and PE four days a week, which give them 70 minutes to collaborate or to have conferences or, or to meet with me or a coach or whatever they need to do. Um, our, our library and our counselor have flexible schedules so they're able to bring classes in there at different times and the library of course is open for students in and out all the time. Pretty much our counselors run too. Um, we, we're growing, not getting for close to pain. That just is exhausting to listen to those those numbers, but we're we're making steady growth. Um, it's, it's averaging like around, around 20 students a year. Um, so we finished the year with five, 25 ish around there, and I, I really think we'll be closer to 540 this year, which will be the highest enrollment we've ever had at Cahaba. Our big growth this year is coming from K and one. So to me, that says this is going to be a long-term issue and they are going to continue to, to, um, to grow. The good thing is that the board had forethought and we have empty rooms. So we're not out of space and we have plenty of places to put, put the students as they, as they come. Um, we have only had 30 faculty members leave this year, two moving um, to other towns. Um, and one, she told me when she was hired that I had three years in math, her student loans would be paid off and she was going to be a stay at home mom and a PTO member at Cahaw. So, <laughs> so she's not really leaving, but she is. And all of those vacancies have been filled and we're really excited about um, those new people coming in. They've already been in the building getting settled. Um, we, we threw the lucky straw this year and you know, the first the wax we done were finished. So they've already, teachers are already in the building working. Um, like um, Dr. Fowles mentioned, we are doing STEM certification like everyone else. And we are <coughs> hoping to finish up most of that before school starts. Um, but it's kind of like the springboard for all of our goals for this year. Um, we started working at the, the end of last year on a maker space. Um, our key person that started that is Portia Franklin. He's our gate teacher. And her thoughts are that it needs to be a space and we need to provide some of these activities and things for all students, not just for students who tested in the gate. Um, it, it's a, I'm learning about a maker space. One of the first things I learned is every school has a different definition for what the maker space is. So we're working with a committee that will be meeting in a couple of weeks to further define what our maker space is going to be. Um, but I do know that we are planning on it, providing um, more opportunities for our students to learn and dig deeper into things that they are interested in. Um, one of the first examples that came to me is like, you know, if our, we've got to identify what those things are, but if, if a student's really interested in learning about drones and how to fly drones, then our goal would be to bring in someone to do some mini lessons in a little mini course. So that group of students can learn more about that and how that, the things that they're learning through the standards in our curriculum impact that hobby. And you can do that with, careers and all sorts of things. It's kind of like the old fashioned career day being reinvented through STEM. Um, and as a part of that is 
rebranding our rich time um, we had from two to three in the afternoons and um, we did courses that our specialists taught and the teachers partnered and it was cross-curricular studies that provided more rigor for our students and we're going to meet with another team of teachers that um, so you'll be hearing more about that and a new name for that but our um, science olympiad team will be able to meet one day one afternoon for an hour during school and then another hour after school same thing for our math teams so it will give them more um, exposure to those things um, one commitment that i am um, our school really wants to make is making sure that our students all become experts on the Cahaba projects area. And um, I've met with the Heritage Foundation. I've also talked to the Cahaba River people. And we're going to create some, some uh, units of study where, where by the time they leave Cahaba, they can join in any conversation areas about the projects, about the houses, about the history, about the river. Um, I just feel like if they go there for six years, they ought to be experts in the area when they leave there. And that all can tie in to all the standards and it is very relevant and something that they're interested in. Um, so we're excited about that and some partnerships that we've made in the community. Um, and um, lastly is our, our culture. We want to further refine and define our culture at Cahaba through the development of a mission statement and a student pledge. Um, I have a teacher, Lisa Rich, she's working on her um, administration leadership um, credentials right now. That was, she came to me and she said, hey, would you be interested in me as working with the staff? Um, doing? I said, yeah, it's been on my list of things to do for years. And we, we have failed to do that. We've just relied on the district's mission statement. So um, we're excited about that and getting students involved with that too. Okay. Any questions? We're excited, real excited about this. Year. It's nice to be in June and planning and Yeah, it, it's been, um, the yeah. teachers are more excited this year than I've seen them in years, and we all know why. But um, they, are, they are just on, on fire. I mean, Third grade teachers brought in a stack of books. These are the books we want to do this year. Can you look through these? <laughs> and I was like, where's Miss Prickett? She can bet all these books. <laughs> um, but yes, it's it's an um, exciting time and trustful for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least is Mr. Sidewell. <laughs> <laughs> there was a long drive, and I had to take 459 to make extra hassle. But you're worth it. And I wanted to. It's not a good thing to talk about. Um, <laughs> don't like laughter. We don't even know what you say. Yeah, there's a huge wreck on 59. Oh, so wow. oh okay. 59. I came from Tuscaloosa. Oh, so we've been here since noon. You don't come? We've been here since noon. So oh, oh, okay. Like, you're you're really right. Right. Yeah. It could be yeah. mess. Get the boat back. Should be. It could be snow. Yeah. Everything was fine in Tuscaloosa. Roll tight. Okay. Oh, oh, nice. Nice. Can I get a roll tide? <laughs> okay. All right. So looking ahead to HTHS for the next school year, we've got three goals we're working with and have been working with. Of course, number one goal being uh, we are in cohort 15, which is starting uh, this year with A plus college ready. And that's going to be guiding our teaching and learning. That's through the trainings that teachers are getting on curriculum and strategies. We hosted the a -plus training last week for uh, several hundred teachers across the state. We have a large group of teachers going to Decatur in July for uh, additional training if they couldn't come to uh, the trustful training. Then there's also a virtual option. But the A-plus college ready grant is primarily um, offering of course, $40 AP test to students. 
$100 gift cards to students who have qualifying scores on their AP exam, compensation for teachers for attending training, compensation for teachers for number of students who have qualifying scores on the AP test, and compensation to teachers who meet growth goals for, you know, we have a vibrant AP program, but it's about taking it to the next level. And that's our reason for the participation. We want it to grow. So teachers that can grow their en enrollment in their courses and their performance are compensated for that. So A plus college rate is gonna be uh, providing opportunities uh, this year for a lot of what the middle school has been doing with um, vertical teaming opportunities, um, classroom learning walks, um, all of the things that are gonna bring us together uh, for our academic growth. Our second goal will be continued emphasis on our ACT performance. We did see growth on our junior ACT, almost um, a really healthy growth um, but we want to continue with our mock ACT test for the juniors, focusing on cross content literacy strategies for all contents. We did a lot with read more, read better this year, and um, we want to uh, see our ACT continue to grow. A lot of our involvement, you know, the more kids you have involved with AP courses, that's going to grow your ACT performance as well. We heard from three students today who talked about their ACT pre-AP courses and post-AP courses. And the three students who gave testimony said their ACT score went up seven, eight points just from being a part of AP curriculum. Um, and our third goal is a focus on our school community connections. Uh, we're looking forward to our second year of HT leadership and their involvement with the City of Trustful, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we want to do whatever we can at the school to uh, optimize involvement with anything from uh, our special ed uh, homecoming dances and special ed Olympics and anything that brings people in Birmingham wide. I think that's important for not just our community, but our school district. Um, you know, band, athletics, theater, choir, all of those are programs that bring community in, parents in, and uh, really give us a chance to shine uh, for what our kids can do at the school. We want to continue our UAB partnership, our partnership with Sanford University, where we have spring interns coming in every spring and doing observation time with uh, teachers. So anything that takes us beyond our 6450 Husky Parkway location, I think it's gonna be good for us. And that's important, takes a lot of work, uh, takes a lot of oversight, but it uh, reaps a lot of awards. For student numbers, uh, we started the school year with 1,552 students, we ended the school year with 1,595 students. And as of yesterday, we had 1,558 enrolled. So we're just now starting our summer enrollment. We've probably only done about 10 or so, maybe, of summer enrollment. So it'll be interesting to see what that enrollment on the first day of this school year looks like. We did exit 392 seniors. And as of yesterday, we had 365 freshmen headed our way. Uh, typically, you'll have, a, it's not uncommon for your new students to be in the ninth grade if they're coming from other school districts. So we will monitor that. Faculty numbers, Hugh Trustful High School had two retirees, one resignation, one non-renewal and four teachers moving out of the state or city. We are not fully staffed at this time, but uh, as of yesterday, we've hired teachers from Tennessee, Colorado, Jefferson County Schools, Springville Schools, Hoover, and Delta. New offerings for courses, 
Coming up, uh, we will be offering AP Computer Science A. We've offered it before, but we've never had a dedicated live teacher teaching it. The students have done it on their own. Uh, but one of our new teachers coming in uh, is going to be helping us with computer science. We'll be able to do more in that area. So we're excited about having a live class of AP Computer Science A, and we might see a real increase in numbers if the students know there's a live teacher who can provide that for them. Uh, our Spanish department is really doing well. They like all the Spanish teachers. So when they like the teachers, they sign up for the courses. So we've got three additional Spanish sections we're gonna have to uh, open. Um, typically we have one EMT class and this year we're gonna have to have two due to interest. So that's, that's a good sign. Um, we are opening AP Biology to freshmen. So that'll be actually two AP courses, a freshman could take world history and AP biology. That will serve two purposes. One, giving more opportunities for freshmen and AP, but also later on when they're juniors or seniors, giving an opportunity to take an AP physics class. So giving some more room there. Um, we won't be having any firefighter training on campus, but we do have a a plan in place with several students who will be doing their firefighter training through co-op this coming year. No one on site, but they'll be going there for the training. So that'll work out very well for them. And we'll have dual enrollment in pre-cal. We have about 15 students who signed up for pre-cal dual enrollment. Keep your fingers crossed, they have all the qualifications. And if that's the case, then we can offer that course for dual enrollment along with dual enrollment English and dual enrollment speech. Um, and then sports medicine, I failed to mention. Our athletic trainer we're working with is um, experienced in teaching sports medicine. He did that at Pell City. So he is going to teach two sections of that course. And we're excited about that. We are here to offer the opportunities for students. Any questions? Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for giving the right job. It's time to close the retreat with the board picture. So I believe it's time for them to come down for us tonight. I think so. Oh, well, it's not one let's do it. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so I'll, I'll come up there first thing that we do on the other side. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so tired.
I'm going to go ahead and call this June the Bible Club. We'll call this June meeting to order. And we've been here a little while and we've had a great day. So, a great retreat. So, if everyone will please stand. Mr. Sims is going to give us our prayer and uh, ladies and the Pledge of Allegiance. God, we thank you so much just for the incredible opportunities we have for us. We look back and reflect on the basic success of. This last school year, we're grateful for a school and a city that work together. We're grateful for parents and, and just to love the children, God. And Lord, as we uh, make plans tonight and the weeks and months to come for the next year, God, we just pray to lift up each and every educator, the parents, the students, God, that they arrive ready to learn and grow, God. And that you just put us all here to be difference makers. So bless our plans and bless our time together. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Pledge. Attention. Salute. Pledge. Pledge to the flag. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, another God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Sanford, you'll call Rose, please. Kathy Brown, here. Kim DeShazo, here. Mark Sands, here. Sherry Talbot, here. Steve Ward, here. Okay, thank you. We'd just like to welcome everybody here that's here tonight, and we look forward to a good meeting. Um, now it's time to adopt our agenda, so I have a motion from the board to adopt our agenda. Second. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, we usually hear from our city council liaison, Ms. Lisa Bright, but she is at a city council. Council workshop, so that's where she should be. <laughs> but she did give us a little report to read. Um, she said pickleball courts will not be built in the Greenway and an alter alternate place is being sought. This project is funded through a state grant and at no cost to the city. Uh, they will be recognizing Riley Quick at the council tonight for being named Mr. Baseball and will recognize Kenley Callan. Kayla at a later council meeting, uh, working with a developer on a potential road connecting Camp Coleman to Commerce Lane. This road will provide an alternate route for residents where the train has been blocked. And that's how that's what she led us her report. So, okay, turn it over to Dr. Neal for uh, recognitions. Okay. We have some teachers retiring. And for the entire school year, we bring everyone in, whether they're retired in August or September or whatever the month was. At the end of the year, we bring all the retirees in. So if you are a retiree from Trustful City Schools, please stand. Please stand. <laughs> So um, I will I will go ahead and start with Jamie first. <laughs> Why don't you come over yeah. to the microphone and uh, we'll put out a plaque for you and oh, tell wow. us how many years you taught and congratulations. Thank you for teaching the biomedical flex. Yes. And tell us a little bit about your experience oh, years of teaching. <laughs> I know what it is. Uh, thank you. Yeah, 31 years of teaching, and uh, it's going to be weird because since I started, this is all I've ever done. So uh, I guess I got to go get a real job now. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's been fun teaching and coaching. I've been blessed. And I, I, I kind of did a number. It's about 3,700 students and about 4,000 students that I've coached. So uh, that's pretty awesome to get to be a part of their life and, and uh, kind of move on. So anyway, this is great. And, Got two of my sons here. They're new graduates, one from 2016 and just last year. So 
um, and my new grandbaby's in. They were all coming down, but I didn't feel like mother was in. So anyway, uh, this is awesome, and I appreciate it. Thank you all very much. It's been great. It's been 25 years at Hewitt, and uh, it's, oh, it's wow. been a great ride. So got here in 1997. Well, it's been fun. Uh, I figured out I think it was nine different science classes I've taught through the years. Wow. Uh, six different sports. So apparently I'm not real good at anything. So <laughs> <keep on. laughs>
Thank you very much. That, that includes, for the record, a 4% raise for all employees. I'm very excited about that. So, Mr. Kirkland, we can go forward. Uh, under personnel, Roman numeral two, I recommend the board approve our recommendations for changes in personnel, contracts, extra services, and supplements. Do I have a motion to approve superintendent's recommendations regarding changes in personnel, contracts, extra services, and supplements as listed? A second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, at this point, uh, item B is in Dr. Neal, uh, in Dr. Neal's contract is listed, which we just uh, renewed. I'm sorry. Um, it's listed that she does not get a raise unless all, all the employees get a raise. So at this time, to make it official, we need a motion to approve Dr. Neal get the same 4% raise as our other employees. So do I have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion carried. Thank you very much. We do not have any delegations speaking tonight, so. Do I make a motion to adjourn? Do I have a motion? All in favor, please stand. <laughs>